Cleveland, Ohio on a cool, damp Midwestern evening. Tonight, in an important AFC Central Division matchup, the Cleveland Browns are host to the Cincinnati Bengals. Cleveland Stadium, located on the shoreline of Lake Erie, sold out tonight, and it will be rocking as the Browns attempt to stay close to the Bengals in their division. Cleveland is 2-4, and four, but should the Browns win tonight, they will be tied with Pittsburgh, one game back of Cincinnati and Houston, and certainly very much alive. The setting is perfect for the Battle of Ohio, two teams representing two cities that also have been caught up in this rivalry. Cleveland Stadium, it holds 80,000 plus and is sold out tonight for a critical game between the Bengals and the Browns in the Central Division of the American Football Conference. Hello again, everyone. I'm Frank Gifford, along with Al Michaels, Dan Deardorff. Glad you're aboard for what we think will be a fine football game. You can feel it in the air. There is an air of electricity here tonight. So important to these Cleveland Browns. They won't say it, but you get the feeling the players know they lose tonight and they can forget about the season of 1990. Meanwhile, the Cincinnati Bengals, well, they're a team you can't really figure. Three weeks ago, we had them on Monday night against Seattle. Seattle edged them in that one. A week later, they killed the Los Angeles Rams. And last week, they got blown away 48-17 by the Houston Oilers. So, Al, what kind of a team is going to show up tonight? Uh, it's really hard to tell with these Bengals. That's the big question. They're a weird team. They can look great one week, terrible the next. But if they win tonight, they are going to be in excellent shape. Because right now, they're in the midst of a five-game road trip. This is the fourth of those five. Next week, they play the staggering Falcons. Then the season's at the halfway mark. And in the second half of the season, the Bengals will play six of their eight games at home. They have a couple of problems, though. The defense has not been good. And the running game, strangely, has gone south. Last year, the Bengals led the league in rushing. This year, coming into this weekend's play, the Bengals are 18th. The bad news tonight, James Brooks is hurt, sore neck, his action could be limited. The good news is, Icky Woods will play for the first time in more than a year after tearing up his knee in week two of 1989. And he has promised if he gets into the end zone tonight, you will see the Icky shuffle. So the Bengals look for a win against the Browns. And Dan, uh, two weeks ago, we're in Denver. The Browns go in. The big story is Bud Carson's future. And a fortnight later, the big story is Bud Carson's future. Oh, what a difference two weeks <laughs> didn't make. <laughs> because, unfortunately, it was squandered with a loss last week down in New Orleans. And Bud Carson, a good football coach, but he's the coach of a football team. Well, I don't know that a football team in the National Football League is more important to their community than the Cleveland Browns are to this city of Cleveland. If by chance the Browns would lose tonight, Bud Carson's record would fall to 12, 12, and 1, 500. But even more importantly, against the Cincinnati Bengals, he would be 0 and 3. When the Cleveland Browns and the players needed to get a big win for their coach Bud Carson two weeks ago in Denver, they got it. I look for the Browns with another good game here tonight. And it is dry here in Cleveland. Cleveland Stadium is sold out, so close to 80,000 will look on. We had some rain through much of the morning and part of the afternoon, but the field was covered, and it's in pretty good shape, all things considered, or as good as Cleveland Stadium really ever gets, as Brian Wagner will kick off for the Browns. Stanford Jennings and Mitchell Price back to receive for Cincinnati. That's Price on the right. Price was the fellow who returned the punt for a touchdown in a Monday night game at Seattle three weeks ago. The Battle of the Buckeyes stayed underway. Good deep kick and downed in the end zone by Sanford Jennings. So here come the Bengals to begin the first drive of the game from the 20 yard line. Boomer Esiason with one more touchdown pass and interception thus far this season. Had a long day last week at Houston. And Harold Green and Craig Taylor start in the backfield with him, with Brooks and Woods for the moment on the bench. But McGee and Brown are both back. Brown hasn't played since Seattle. Holman, the tight end. The guys up front, of course, the key man. 78, as good as it gets. Anthony Munoz, the left tackle. And the Bengals start by sending Taylor off left tackle for a minimal game. Craig Taylor, the fullback, the second-year player out of West Virginia. As we take a look at the Browns' defense, they play a 4-3 with Bubba Baker, Chris Pike. We'll watch Michael Dean Perry. He is banged up and didn't practice last week. Number 92, Robert Banks on the outside. 
Matthews, Mike Johnson, and Dave Grayson, who was reinstated as a starter last week. Minifield, you knew about his holdout, didn't sign until the Denver game. Wright was also a late signee in that backfield. Claiborne is the longtime New England Patriots signed as a play and B player in the offseason. On second and nine, Esiason stepping up and gets tripped up from behind after a gain of three. Al Baker caught him by a shoelace, and it will be third down and six. The Bengals, per usual, going with their attack offense. That's what they call the attack. They rarely huddle in the conventional sense. And they come up to the line with a third and six from the 24. And they keep it on the ground. The rookie, Harold Green, has the first down, turns the corner, out past the 40, into Cleveland territory, and he takes it down to the 37-yard line. The number two draft choice out of South Carolina, Harold Green, has just given the Bengals their longest run of the season. Up to tonight, the longest run, 18 yards. And Harold Green, kind of a surprise second-round draft pick, had great numbers at South Carolina, but he was around and surprised the Bengals when he was available in the second round. Brennan gets a block on the backside, and Green does the rest. Sprinting away from a good tackler, Thane Gash, breaking it back to the inside. Nifty run by the rookie out of South Carolina. 39-yard pickup for him. And a first and 10 for the Bengals at the Cleveland 37-yard line. This is Taylor. He is run out of bounds at the 32. Clay Matthews, the outside linebacker, gets credit for the tackle after a gain of five. Sam White. The Bengal coach, much in the news, of course, for a number of reasons over the past few weeks. And somehow trying to keep his team from being distracted since the incident in Seattle. The night they lost, they went down to Anaheim, beat the Rams in overtime, then went to Houston last week and were blown away by the Oilers. Second and five. Flag down. Esiason with time, and Esiason going deep, and it's Rodney Holman unable to hold on at the goal line, and let's see about the penalty. I think we might have had motion down here at the bottom. Looked like Tim McGee was moving at the same time that Eddie Brown was in motion across the formation. You can't have two people in motion at the snap of the ball. Number 85, offense. Five yards, second down. You're not a, here's, here's McGee right here, and here's Eddie Brown in motion. Watch McGee kind of give a little stutter step. And now you see Brown in motion, and there is Tim McGee that just anticipated the snap count. You can't have two people moving when the ball is snapped. On second and nine, this is Harold Green fighting his way to the 33-yard line. And that's going to set up a third and six. And this is when the Browns would like to change into a nickel defense, change their personnel defensively, but the attack offense does what it's designed to do. It keeps the defense of the Browns on the field. Now, should the Browns, Bud Carson, try to substitute, Boomer Siasen would turn around on a quick count, and they would catch the Browns with 12 men on the field. Bud Carson says, I'll play him with my best 12 men, but you get the feeling that Bud Carson doesn't like this whole thing. Four wideouts in this set on third and six from the 33-yard line. Esiason with a lot of time and throws complete for a first down. The far side, that's Eddie Brown making the catch. Eddie Brown, who has not played since the Monday night game in Seattle. He was shaken up in that game and missed two weeks, and back he is tonight. Oh, and they got the perfect setup. They get Eddie Brown with all his speed on number 22, the strong safety. That's Felix Wright trying to cover him. And look how far Wright is off that coverage. Felix Wright, a good strong safety. He'll hit you, he'll bomb you, he can cover a tight end, but he'll never cover a wide receiver like an Eddie Brown. 11-yard gain. Opening drive of the game. Cincinnati has moved from its 20 
to the 22-yard line. Bummer's like a traffic cop out there. And he hands the ball off to Taylor, who picks up a hard two to the 20. It'll be second and eight. You know, a guy that we ought to keep our eye on tonight up front is Michael Dean Perry, the great defensive tackle, number 92, for the Cleveland Browns. There's so much pressure on Perry here this evening. He's the guy that has to penetrate. Look at him anticipate, and look, look how he gets across the line of scrimmage. Even though he doesn't make the tackle, he gets in with an assist. He disrupted the play. But he's really the Browns' only legitimate pass rusher. If he doesn't get to Esiason, the Browns are in trouble tonight. Second and eight at the 20. Esiason flexing Holman to the right. There's the play clock down to six. Esiason with a good play fake as usual and a touchdown. Nobody handles the ball as well as Boomer. He sucks in the defense. Holman, who he flexed to the right at the line of scrimmage, gets free, and Cincinnati moves 80 yards to score. The beautiful part of that play action was that Boomer got rid of the ball so quickly because that time he was being pressured on the outside by Al Baker. Watch number 60 there on your screen. He's going to move upfield and force a quick throw. But Clay Matthews, the great all-pro linebacker, on this play, no match for keeping up with Rodney Holman. Matthews beaten badly. He's one of the best. And Rodney Holman, of course, a pro bowl, tight end, fifth reception a year ago. You're never going to yeah. cover him with a linebacker like you're never going to cover Eddie Brown with a strong safety. It just can't be done. Well, that's, that's a bad mismatch, Frank, taking a 13-year linebacker like Clay Matthews and expecting him to run with Holman. And yet Cincinnati's getting exactly what they want with their attack offense. They're getting mismatches offensively and they are really exploiting them early. Jim Breach kicks the extra point and the Bengals take the opening kickoff 80 yards in 5 minutes and 19 seconds and lead 7-0. The Cincinnati Bengals marching 80 yards to score and leading 7-0 and it's Lee Johnson who will kick off. Eric Metcalf who returned the opening kickoff in week 2 against the Jets for a touchdown. Back to receive. Metcalf two yards in, and he will down it in the end zone. And so the Browns, just like the Bengals, will begin their first drive from the 20-yard line. Bernie Kozar, big night when we saw him two weeks ago in Denver, guiding the team from behind, a nine-point deficit in the fourth quarter. Kozar from the University of Miami, Leroy Horde out of Michigan, the rookie with Kevin Mack who's playing very well, Slaughter and Brian Brennan, the wideouts, and Newsom, the longtime tight end, the revamped offensive front, the one guy whose name you'll notice was missing, the wide receiver, Reggie Langhorn, broken ribs on injured reserve, and so Brennan, normally the number three receiver, he's at the bottom of the screen, gets the start tonight. And this is Mack, back of a block from Horde, touch inside it, and picks up five, out to the 25-yard line. The defense for the Bengals, and it has been a very suspect defense, especially in the secondary. And here's the way Cincinnati lines up with a three-man front, McClendon, Crumry, and Buck. So they do a lot of maneuvering up there. Guys in and out. Key linebacker, the rookie out of Baylor, James Francis, with six sacks. He's been outstanding. The secondary is really banged up. And Warren Moon had a field day at the Astrodome last Sunday. On second and five, Ford, the Michigan rookie, picks up a first down as he takes it out to the 32-yard line. And that's good news for the Browns because Ford had not picked up any first downs in the last two games. There is Reggie Langhorn. Langhorn, their leading receiver. But he was hurt last week. He's caught 26 balls. And they are not particularly deep in that category. So Brennan gets the start in his place. And then they go to people like Eugene Rowell, who they've just activated, and Vernon joins. First and ten, and Kozar gets hit as he throws, and it's incomplete. His arm was coming forward, and that's the aforementioned James Francis. He of the half-dozen sacks who gets in there to break it up. Uh, you have to assume that was some kind of a mistake by the Browns because James Francis, James Francis is untouched. You see John Talley, the tight end, releasing to go downfield. And that time Francis comes in totally untouched. And boy, how close to a fumble was that? 
ruled an incomplete pass, but again, let's see how close this was to a fumble. Any forward movement? I think that's a fumble. Mm -hmm. Boy, that looked like Bernie Kozar was still in the process of cocking his arm. Too late for a review, a second and 10. And it's Kevin Mack picking up two as he takes it up to the 34-yard line where it will be third down and eight. Actually, Al, I think that falls into the category where they wouldn't review it anyway because a whistle blew on mm -hmm. uh, the incomplete pass, and that's the end of it. Yeah. Anything that happens after a whistle blows is, is mm -hmm. a dead play. This isn't even reflected now in the number of sacks, and Bernie Kozar has been sacked 17 times this year, but he has been hit many, many more times than that just like that. Oh, but that was a good break for the Cleveland Browns because that was a fumble. 16 sacks and 31 knockdowns. Third down and seven. Kozar throws. It's a nice out pattern to Brian Brennan. And a first down, Rod Jones with the coverage with a crafty one. Brian Brennan has been around for a while. In his seventh year out of Boston College, picks up the first down for Cleveland. He doesn't have the blazing speed, does Brian Brennan of Reggie Langhorn, but when he gets tied up one-on-one, -on -one, as he does here with number 25, Rod Jones, Brennan with a little move just makes Jones hesitate for just a moment. He gets a three- or four-yard jump on him. He's been doing that for six years. He's not a big loss. I mean, Reggie Langhorn is a great player, but Brennan is an excellent receiver to have come off the bench. From the 48-yard line, Horde runs right in to number 91, Carl Zander, who meets him behind the line of scrimmage. You're right, Frank, about Brennan. He has, I think the difference for Cleveland, though, is going to be when they go to the, the four wide outs and you have to start going to, to joins, even though he played well in that Monday night game, and Eugene Rowell. Well, and the other thing is, uh, this is a game where people get hurt. I think the Cleveland Browns have very little margin for error now uh, if they should have any injuries in their wide receiver court. Second and 11, Cleveland at its 47. Six and a half minutes to go in the opening quarter. Metcalf is in motion. And Kozar with a short drop, and then his receiver falls down. That's Webster Slaughter, who slips on the turf, and it will be third down and 11. Well, coming up, college football on ABC this Saturday. Regional coverage. Check your local listings for the game in your area in the east and Midwest, most of you will see Michigan taking on the Hoosiers of Indiana and out west. The Trojans of USC go to Tempe to take on Arizona State at 3.30 Eastern and 12.30 Pacific. Dan yeah. and I are both quite quiet yeah. <laughs> on this Monday night. Well, you two lock horns this week, That's right? right, and I'm very quiet, too. <laughs> USC and Arizona Yeah, Al, you haven't been talking to them up much lately. Yeah, like the postgraduate work in Virginia. On third and 11, the catch is made by Slaughter on the far side for a first down. Oh, and a good pickup by the offensive line of the Browns. An uh, offensive line that's totally different than a year ago, but there was a blitz coming in. Kevin Mack, the big fullback, stepped up and picked up the blitz man, Mitchell Price, and he gave Kozar the time that he needed. And believe me, he needs some time. And a good out by Slaughter. And the first down. That's just like you draw it up. You pick up the blitz, you get the time to release it, and Bernie's going to get it there. 14-yard gain. And here's Kevin Mack plowing ahead for a couple. And what a difference Mack can make. You know, the funny thing about the Browns is you go back to 85, they had two guys each gain over 1,000 yards. Mack was one. Ernest Bina was the other. But it has been steadily diminishing returns in Cleveland's ground attack through the years. Well, you look at what's happened so far in 1990 Kevin Mack is the only runner that's really accomplishing anything on the ground you look at him with almost a five yard per carry average Metcalf and Horde uh, both below three Metcalf below two second and eight Kozar gets protection and then throws and almost a one handed catch by Slaughter as he skirted the sideline, but it's incomplete, and it will be third down and eight. You have to suspect that Kozar spotted something, and it was a single coverage defensively. Rod Jones, they're going to try and work on him anytime they can, and Slaughter actually had him beaten, but it would have had to be the perfect pass. And it almost was, and almost a spectacular catch by Slaughter but almost will get to third down and eight. Yeah, he would have been well out of bounds even if he would have brought that catch in. At least a yard, yard and a half out of bounds. Four receivers with three of them 
heading down the left side and Tozar looking that way and he has Brennan for a first down at the 22 yard line now we're going to see this all night Brennan working underneath Slaughter taking it deep with Metcalf and Brennan coming in motion getting open and Kozar right there as long as Kozar has the time he's going to be able to find the open receiver and again the man they victimize in as you might suspect Rod Jones who along with Carl Carter for Cincinnati have been having their problems this year nice pass down in the dog hmm. pound huh? Coneheads in Cleveland first and ten at the 21 here's Metcalf on a sweep and he Whoa. picks up about four and he really takes the pop he gets run out of bounds Brown wants a flag Fussy hit him Dixon hit him and there might be a marker down on the ground there is in fact referee tonight is Bob McElwee well that hit came well out of bounds I think Ricky Dixon was the hit defensive back that came over there and tagged Eric Metcalf Hey, I like the way Eric carried it right into him. He got everything he could get out of it. Watch the right of your screen. Personal foul, number 29 defense. Lee hit out of bounds. Half the distance to the goal line. First down. Well, I think Ricky Dixon uh, made a tag on Eric Metcalf a good two to three yards out of bounds. Let's take a look at it here from our reverse angle. But the initial contact right there, Eric Metcalf is out of bounds. And he's almost out of the white stripe when Ricky Dixon comes over and hits him. That'll bring the flag every time. First and goal from the eight. Mack. Xander made the initial contact. He picked up uh, about three as the Browns try to emulate what the Bengals did. Cincinnati took the opening kickoff 80 yards. And this is uh, a drive that began at the Cleveland 20. Bengals have allowed nine touchdown drives of 80 yards or more, and that uh, really illustrates the problems they're having on defense, and they're on the verge of making it 10. That's why statistically they're ranked as the worst defense in the NFL, giving up over 400 yards a game. Those are big numbers. Second and goal from the five. Mack in motion. Swing it out to Metcalf. Mack can't lay down the block and because of that Rod Jones is there to tackle him at the nine yard line. Frank, uh, that's a screen that's telegraphed all the way. <laughs> I mean, Bernie Kozar never even looks away. <laughs> Everyone knows it's going there. That's a difficult screen to execute. I mean, they're putting a lot of pressure on that lead block. And they've been doing it all season long with him too. I mean, and the idea is good, but I mean once it happens, you can hear you, we, we had sound out there. You would hear all of them watch the screen, watch the screen. And it was a good play, though, to make the tackle as Mac is ordinarily a pretty good blocker. I'm not a big fan of that uh, that screen with the... Uh, yeah, you might with, as well tell them what you're doing. Yeah, so few options. Third down and goal. And Kozar throws to Mac. Mac is hit, and Mac is pushed back from the four-yard line. The initial contact was made by Ricky Dixon. And so the Cleveland drive bogged down and the Browns will have to send in the field goal unit. Well, and there's an injured Bengal. It is Ricky Dixon who made the hit. Well, he came up and made the hit and then slid right off of Kevin Mack, but what a superb play that time by Ricky Dixon. He atones for that late hit out of bounds because Kevin Mack is into the end zone if Dixon doesn't come up and stymie Kevin Mack. Well, he took he paid the back with the <laughs> right head on with the helmet and Ricky Dixon of course missed so much of the preseason and only came back a couple of weeks ago from arthroscopic surgery back in August but they're not looking at the legs I think that was just a, a contact blow to the head because Mac is a big man and they hit head on well Dixon shaking up here Carl Carter comes into the game banged up and let's not forget Eric Thomas the all-pro cornerback gone for the season who injured himself uh, tore his knee up in a basketball game in the offseason Mac is putting his head down we've seen him run over so many tackles a few moments ago you saw him take Carl Zander on bounce off for about three yards and he's a tough man to bring down that's a great effort by Dixon and he paid the price yeah you can't overestimate uh, the quality of that hit and that stoppage by Ricky Dixon so the Browns 
15 plays they run on this long drive. 2.48 to go in the quarter. And they'll try to settle for three. Jerry Corrick, the longtime CFL star in his first year with the Browns. 21-yard attempt. Mike Tagel to hold. Ooh. <laughs> Couple to push it through. You're being kind. Yeah, just barely. Knuckled it. 2.37 to go in the first quarter in Cleveland. Cincinnati leads by four. Kick off. Brian Wagner booms one for the second time. It's a touchback. Stanford Jennings downs it in the end zone. And let's have another look at that extra point. Yeah, we want to show you this. Now take a look at this field goal attempt, but stop it right there. Do you see right here where it touches the hand? That's Mike Hammerstein. He touches the ball, so that's a low kick by Corrick. It was good, but it might come into play later. Goodyear Blimp Enterprise hovering above Cleveland Stadium. Downtown on the right is the famed Terminal Tower, the signature landmark in the downtown region. Goodyear Blimp uh, Enterprise, Pat Henry at the controls. As we come back to live action in Cleveland on first down from the 20, Boomer Esiason going deep and has it intercepted by Frank Minifield at the 45 of Cleveland, and the dogs are barking. A real bad choice by Boomer. He just threw that into a crowd. One defender actually slipped, and Minifield was there, double coverage, and Minifield, who came in, after the season started three weeks ago has got another interception. And Boomer, that's oh, really uh, an off year for Boomer in the interception department. This is his 11th interception of the season. And you can see this ball just didn't have much on it. I mean, it was tossed up. You can see it had very little velocity on it and a relatively easy interception for Frank Minifield. His second of the year. It's Uncharacteristic of Boomer Esiason. First down, Cleveland from the 45. Bengals ahead 7-3, 2.23 to go in the opening quarter, and they give it to the up back. That's Kevin Mack who plows forward to the 48-yard line. It'll be second and seven. Francis in on the tackle. Frank Minifield picking off the Esaias and pass. Very, very unusual for Boomer. As Dan mentioned, same number of interceptions as touchdown passes. Second and seven from the 48-yard line. Leroy Horde across the 50 takes it to the Cincinnati 47-yard line where Bussey comes up to greet him. We just showed you that graphic of Boomer Esiason and his ratio of, of touchdowns per pass attempt. Uh, on the other hand, Bernie Kozar, uh, his counterpart on the other side of the field, uh, one of the all-time greats. I think only one in 41 attempts does Bernie Kozar get intercepted. That's the best in NFL history. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at uh, kind of two sides of the coin here tonight. The amazing thing about Kozar, in over half his lifetime starts, he has not had a pass intercepted. Third and two from the 47-yard line. Play clock is down to one, and they just do get it off. And Kozar gets flushed out. He's not very mobile, but he <laughs> dives and picks up the first down. Oh, about a 5.6 in style points, but he got it done. You won't find that in the uh, Clark Museum, but uh, he picks up the first down. A roar from the dog pound, as well he should. <laughs> Even he gets that big, lanky body, and he's six foot five moving. Sometimes it takes a little while. <laughs> I don't think it's a word. I know it's not a word, but I used to have a teammate that every time he had an ugly block, the coach would get mad at him and say, "Effecticity. That's the key. Effecticity." <laughs> well, this is not a pretty scramble. Well, but it is effective. <laughs> uh, from a 5-6 to a 5-2, it wasn't that good. <laughs> but it was effective. They would time Bernie Kozar in the 40 with a sundial, but that's the first down. Kozar, lowest interception rate in the history of the league, once every 41 passes. 
Montana and Ken O'Brien right back of him. As play resumes on first down, <laughs> Mack somehow bounces off a tackle and goes down the sideline and is out of bounds at the 28 as he bounced off Carl Zander. <laughs> well, we're getting a little bit of everything in this game so far. What's the old saying, Frank? They tell defensive players, wrap up. Xander, did, did <laughs> anyone get that number? Xander stopped you. Ooh, Ooh. he said that smarted. And big Mac has given the Browns a big play. Watch this collision. You won't see many like it. That was a head-on shot. Xander probably never had anyone bounce off him like that. Not often you see two guys hit each other that hard, and neither one of them fall to the ground. Ooh. And that turns out to be the final play of the quarter. Under the new rules, once the ball is signaled ready for play, if you go out of bounds, clock starts at the end of the period. 15 minutes gone. Good 15 minutes. 7-3 Cincy. Back we come after this commercial message and a word from our ABC station. Michael, Frank Gifford, and Dan Beardorf. Action packed first quarter. Cincinnati leads Cleveland. 7-3, and as we start the second period, the Browns have the ball first and 10 at the Cincinnati 28-yard line, and Leroy Horde, the Michigan rookie, picks up four to the 24. It'll be second and six. But Carson has to be enjoying this. When you talk with him, he says, this is the kind of offense I want, the big back offense where we can control the ball on the ground. We don't make mistakes. We got a defense that'll turn it over. He said all the great teams win that way. And... With Mack back and healthy and Horde in there, he has the two big backs to do it. It's just a question of the developing young offensive line. Mack the sole back in this set. They have Metcalf split in the slot to the right on second and six. Short drop by Kozar, looks for Metcalf, but throws it at his feet. Covered by Fulcher, third down. ABC's Monday Night Football is being brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Michelob Dry Beer. Once you experience the bold taste with no aftertaste, there's no going back. Third passing situation for Cleveland. So far on two similar situations, they've looked for Brian Brennan. They move him around until they get the coverage they want. Twice now they've been able to lock him up with a safety man. Now they put him in the slot, top of your screen. Third down and six. And now they put Brennan in motion to the right. Kozar looks the other way, and Kozar throws for slaughter, and he can't make the catch. The coverage on the play by Lewis Phillips to break it up. And it will be fourth down. And you're looking at about a 41-yard field goal attempt for Jerry Corrick. Not bad pass defense by a team that ranked 27th in the league against the pass. That was good coverage by Phillips. Kozar had the time, steps back a little bit, fires that characteristic sidearm shot, and good coverage by Billups. Remember on Korg's last field goal attempt, his kick was low. Let's see if that weighs on his mind here on this attempt. 41-yard attempt. Pagel will put it down at the 31-yard line. And he misses it. Ooh, that'll weigh on his mind. He just left it out there. Ordinarily, that kind of a right footed kicker will get a little bit of a hook and that ball went dead straight didn't hook in and the Browns missed from close in and can't capitalize on the Minifield interception the field I think he hit the ball so low this time trying to get it up quickly that he lost both distance and some control and the pitching wedge to the yeah. it. Well, we, we began the show with a Jack Nicholas tip. I mean, it's like getting out of a bunker That's when you right. try field goals tonight. And believe me, I have lots of experience <laughs> in trying to get out of a bunker. Here's Green taken down by David Grayson. No game at the 24. Well, we talked about the Bengals on the road five consecutive weeks. One of the reasons is the Reds that in postseason play. There it is. They lose to Seattle on a Monday, beat the Rams in the wild one in overtime, lose to Houston, here now, and they go to Atlanta for a Sunday night game against uh, Sam White's old nemesis, Jerry Glanville. But then, as we say, after next week, they are home for six of the last eight. Second and nine, and Messiah throws, and right through the hands of Green. And uh, one problem Green has had this year has been 
fumbling when he's running with the ball, and uh, you can see right there he is not particularly sure-handed catching it either. Kind of interesting, too, because he was a good receiver at South Carolina. He had almost 100 receptions in his career down there. And that one, I think, probably maybe characteristic of a rookie. Well, took his eyes off it a little bit before he got into the hand. Oh, look at the Bengals. They come up in a hurry, and the Browns come up and pick up the football. Did you see the Bengals break their huddle? And Brown's trying to make a change defensively, Dan. Enforcement, 92, defense, five yards. This is what that attack offense will do to a defense. The Bengals scramble up to the line of scrimmage, and the Browns, to keep the snap mm -hmm. from happening, Michael Dean Perry <laughs> just reaches down and knocks the ball away. Michael Dean. <laughs> Look at Mike Johnson. Yeah. He's going to put it back yeah. for him. Well, I'm sorry. You can't replace the Easter egg after it's been in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> there are all forms of encroachment, I suppose. Oh, well, that <laughs> is, is what it does. The attack <laughs> offense. The Browns tried to make a change, and Boomer saw it, and they were going to snap the ball, and they would have caught him with 12 men on the field. That's encroachment and burglary. Third down and four from the 30-yard line. Blitz. Esiason throws incomplete intended as Robert Banks came in Claiborne covering on the play and Mike Barber was the intended receiver watch the contact downfield I don't know if we can see it but Claiborne ran into one of the Bengal receivers and stopped him dead in his track and into Barber <laughs> Boomer uh, was throwing the football where he expected his receiver to be and he wasn't anywhere near Raymond Claiborne got away with one there. Lee Johnson to punt. Stephon Adams is back. A wow. tremendous wow. kick. What a kick. Wow. It bounces inside the 15 and goes across the goal line. Otherwise, that would have been an all-timer. The line of scrimmage was the 30. So it's a 70-yard kick, but a net 50 as it comes out to the 20. Lee Johnson booming one, and the Browns will take over at their own 20-yard line. Lee Johnson using that win to his advantage, 70-yard punt. He had a 70-yarder earlier this year, so he ties his own team record in the longest of his career. Cleveland starts now from the 20. Here's Ford. Runs into a quartet of Bengals up at about the... 24-yard line led by White. It'll be second down and six with 12-12 to play in the opening half. One of the things that Leroy Hart is really working hard on is to control the football. He's had four fumbles already this year and 50 chances of handling the ball, 42 runs and eight pass receptions. And when you're in a grinded-out type of offense, this big back offense that Bud Carson wants to employ, you just can't have a back that puts the ball down on the ground. It won't work. Second and six from the 24-yard line. Metcalf in motion. He gets the ball, but doesn't get a block. And he tackles back of the line of scrimmage as David Grant, number 98, comes knifing through to bust the play up. And one of the problems the Browns are having, finding exactly what to do with Eric Metcalf. He's a gifted broken field runner. And whether or not he can develop into a setback, and I really doubt it in the... Bud Carson's scheme of things because we've already talked about what Bud likes and that's the big back offense. Now, where do you put him? Where do you use him? He's not a punt return man, good kickoff return man. He has difficult feet coming out of the backfield as uh, a la Megat of the Giants. So where do you wind up using him? You put him on AstroTurf if you can. He seems uh, much better suited for that surface and Kozar has to take a timeout because the clock was down to one and Bernie does get the timeout before he has to take a delay of game. So it'll be third down and eight as the Browns have to burn a timeout here with 10.53 to go in the half. Saw Bernie jaw at Brian Brennan, and I think Brennan perhaps was in the wrong formation. Maybe picked it up wrong in the huddle, and Bernie had to use the timeout. Faded, but yet to see duty. Figures two come in pretty soon, though, warming up on the Cincinnati sideline. As play resumes here with Cleveland in possession at its own 22, third down and eight. 
after the timeout. 7-3 since the early second quarter. Nice job of protection, but then Brennan gets upended as the ball gets there. Good timing by Rod Jones, the cornerback. And not a good pass by Kozar, however. Brennan had to wait for it and allowed Jones to hammer him. And Kozar knows that. He ordinarily would have had that right in his hands. He had to stop right here, and here comes Jones. Well, the crowd holds its breath now because Brian Wagner has had four punch blocked in the last three games. They have a new snapper, Mike Morris, the former Seahawk. And you'll hear a big cheer as they get it away. It's not a particularly good kick, but at least it wasn't blocked. And it's Mitchell Price skirting to the outside and then taken down as he reaches the 47-yard line. Vernon joins, makes the tackle. Well, you'll remember last year, Sam White created quite a stir because they were getting unruly in Cincinnati uh, in a game in December. And to quiet the crowd down, Sam uh, grabbed the microphone on the field and uh, had some uh, messages to send to the good folks in Cincinnati. And then what? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Icky Woods is in the game. So here he is in his first activity since week two of 1989. As Esiason goes back to pass and throws, oh, and the catch oh, is made. Beautiful. A beautiful catch by Eddie Brown for a first down at the 29-yard line. Meanwhile, here was what Sam White had to say last December at Riverfront Stadium. Will the next person that sees anybody throw anything onto this field point him out? Get him out of here. You don't live in Cleveland. Get him in <laughs> well, this is his first visit to Cleveland for a game since that moment. But uh, he has been here prior uh, in a charity event. We'll take a look at that in a moment. It's a 30-yard line. And he came waving a white flag. 30-yard <laughs> line first down. And it is Icky Woods picking up two after that great rookie year in 88 hurt in 89 and just to uh, finish up the white story he came back here during the off season and wound up in this charity event for the salvation army in the uh, i guess you call this the dunkathon and uh, took 60 plunges you know i was talking to the guys in dog pound they said they were there and the kozar actually missed seven times before he was able to dunk him <laughs> That was the offseason. You notice they put a net in front of Sam so no one could throw the ball at his face. <laughs> I think that might have been an option that a lot of Brown fans might have opted for. <laughs> Second down and nine from the 29-yard line as the play clock is down to three. And here is James Brooks seeing his first action of the night inside the 10 and a touchdown. James Brooks with that sore neck and that's the reason he didn't start tonight he gets into the game and the first time he touches the ball is for six points and long run of the year for brooks up until tonight he had the big one 18 yards and he just broke that one for about 29. well it's, it's funny what must be going through the head of bud carson they knew coming into this game that one eddie brown was hurt well eddie brown just caught a long pass they knew that Icky Woods hadn't played in over a year. Icky Woods carried the ball, and they knew that James Brooks was hurt, and James Brooks runs it in for a touchdown. Brown, Woods, and Brooks on three consecutive plays hurt the Browns. They better watch for Tim McGee next, right? <laughs> Jim Breed boots it through. So Woods sees his first action in over a year. James Brooks sees his first action of the night. And Cincinnati extends its advantage. And coming in to tonight, Brooks had been averaging a little over three yards. Last year, he averaged almost five. And this is classic Brooks breaking back against the grain, using his speed, and hammering it into the end zone. James Brooks on the left, and behind Craig Taylor sits Zicky Woods. Two vital cogs in Cincinnati's uh, 1988 season when they went to the Super Bowl. Both started tonight on the bench, but instrumental in that drive. As Cincinnati now leads 14-3. And Lee Johnson to kick off. Metcalf in the goal line. 
past the 20. Stopped at the 27-yard line. A week from tonight, we'll go to Pittsburgh. And uh, it's the first time the Steelers have been on uh, Monday Night Football since, I believe, 1986. As they will host the Los Angeles Rams. Big day for Jim Everett. Pictured there yesterday as he led the Rams over Atlanta. Over 300 yards for Jim once again. Three touchdowns, no INTs. And they were down for a while. We brought him back and had an explosive offense once again. Could be a good game. Pittsburgh thrown away by the 49ers, but they're on track again. First and 10 from the 26-yard line. Kozar has it batted back. David Grant and uh, number 50 was right there. James Francis putting the big hand up. And he's 6'5", and they say it doesn't matter, the sidearm delivery, but how many did we see batted down in Denver? Actually, I think that uh, even though Francis is the guy with all the sacks, that time I believe it was David Grant, the guy that got his hand on the ball. They were both side by side. Of course, David Grant 6'5", as well. Take your pick. Second and ten after the rejection from the 26, 8.39 to go in the half. Play clock is down to four. And Kozar has that one intercepted by Leon White. And White is thrown down at the five by Kevin Mack. It'll be first and goal Cincinnati. And the Browns are in big trouble. And I think it's even going to be moved closer to the goal line. I think Mack was guilty of a face mask infraction as well. I'll tell you, that was a great reception by White. That, if he had to catch, he wouldn't catch one out of ten no doing that. Face mask, defense, and force from the end of the play, half the distance to the goal line, first down. And the ball thrown right at number 51, White. He'll go up in the air. But I don't know how you hold on to this. That well, was a great catch. You can see right there that Kevin Mack had the responsibility of chopping the legs out from underneath Leon White to get his hands down hmm. because Bernie Kozar throwing the ball that direction. You can see the face mask here by Kevin Mack right there. Boy, and that's a, a flagrant face mask. That ought to be, you know, a 15-yarder. Tough to assess 15 yards when you can only go half the distance to the goal line. But, boy, that's how you can injure someone. I think that was frustration on the part of Kevin Mack. And next is an O's look from the blimp. First and goal from the two-yard line. And this is Icky Woods. And you know what that means if he gets in. He has promised to shuffle, but uh, he'll be shuffled less for the moment as he gets only to the one-yard line. Second and goal. Yeah, that knee brace he's wearing might limit some of the gyrations. Saw him earlier pacing the sidelines and had to be a very nervous Icky Wood. Dan and I talked to him at Link out in Seattle when he was, said he was ready to go then and getting his first shot in over a year after going over 1,100 yards in 1988. Big Anthony Munoz here, number 78 on the bottom of the screen. Look at him split out as a wide receiver. <laughs> He's got to get somebody up on the line of scrimmage or they're going to be in a bad formation. They got called it for it, too. Yep. And Esaias and throws it. Yep. You've got a flag down. Well, bring it back. Won't count. Yep. Holman. And, and Remember, when, you need seven guys, at least seven on the line. I know what you're going to say. The offensive lineman was right, and he was and right. He was. You see Munoz waving for the guy to get up to the line. Anthony Munoz, yep. he was waving, I think, to Craig Taylor, number 20, get up on the line. He knew it was an illegal formation. Mm -hmm. Rules say you yep. have to have at least seven on the on the line. Uh, Anthony knew that he was in the right position. Well, he knew the formation, and he knew that it was wrong, and he knew that they were going to get called for it. How many times does an offensive lineman get to line up out there? See, here's Munoz right here, but he's looking at Craig Taylor. What Taylor had to do was move up here and get right on the line of scrimmage because they made this left tackle an eligible receiver by him not being covered. And Anthony Munoz was waving... And they also have six men on the line of scrimmage. Look at Munoz's wave right there. Move up, move up. Now. Illegal formation, illegal formation. Man did not report. And the man he's talking about there is the left tackle. Because by being uncovered, not only is he an eligible receiver, you have to report. But Al, 
again, they didn't have seven men on the line of scrimmage. Exactly. Even if he does report, right. it's still an illegal formation. They were wrong on two counts, and Boomer could just forget it. Well, Boomer's probably upset because he feels that perhaps uh, it was reported, but you've got a double infraction there. Even, as we say, if well, he did not report, it's still an illegal formation. Well, Boomer pulling his Roger Clemens here. You better <laughs> not say a no-no, Boomer. Let me get him out of there. Well, I think Boomer is thinking exactly that. He's thinking that Anth they're calling Anthony Munoz for not reporting. Obviously, Munoz did report. Well, White was trying to, for the moment, call a timeout, but Cincinnati has not been charged with one. You've got... A conference with the officials? Sounds like they might be looking at it. White sent, White sent Wilhelm on, onto the field to get a science and away from the officials. Wilhelm is the backup quarterback. They're having a conference out about the 30-yard line. The officials are having a conference. White, I'm sure, is arguing that the man did report at the line of scrimmage, but they still were in an illegal formation. Ooh. Isn't a scoring play a play that falls under review? It is. I'm sure that's but, what's happening uh, at the moment. There's no... They would still negate the touchdown, though, simply by looking at the tape and seeing the illegal formation. Oh, look at Boomer and Sam. Sam Weiss starts out on the field. I suspect there's, I mean, there's something that we can't figure out, but something had to have been said to Esaias. I mean, he's angrier than he would be if uh, he just felt it was simply a matter of somebody having reported and the official saying he hadn't. I mean, yeah. something had to have been said to him. And don't be misled there by Boomer and, uh, and White on the sidelines because they are very close. Almost a brotherly relationship between the two of them. Let's go ahead and take a look again at the formation that's, that's causing all this fuss. I think what they're going to say is that this man right here, that's Ken Moyer, number 73, he has become an eligible receiver because both these two guys are back off the line of scrimmage. That makes him an eligible receiver, and he did not report. That is the penalty that was assessed by the crew. And your second X, that would be Green, should have been up on the line of scrimmage. Right. The funny thing is, too, we just looked it up. Illegal formation is not reviewable. Illegal formation! Illegal formation! That's, that's very interesting. The original call was he didn't report, and then illegal formation is not supposed to be reviewable, but you can't tell me they haven't called down to the umpire to tell him it was an illegal formation to begin with. I think they've got it trained out. That's the best part. Yeah. They're right, as it turns out. They got there in an odd way, but as it turns out, they're a thousand percent right. But I'm trying to figure out why is Boomer arguing so violently here. I mean, what, and I still think that he thought the man had reported. He must think that they're talking about this man here, number 78, Anthony Munoz. Exactly. Anthony, nobody's arguing about where you were. Anthony knows it was an illegal formation. He was the first indication. Well, they can talk about it even longer than we're talking about yeah. it. It's not reviewable, but as we suspected, they did call upstairs to substantiate, even though it's not reviewable. Oh boy, we're so, taking this to a new well, level. They got it? it right. Meanwhile, look at the play clock. It's second and goal, and Esiason flushed out of the pocket, throws off Holman's hand, and incomplete. Third and goal. So as we suspected, and Kenny Wolf is now telling me that they did call up, even though it is it is not reviewable, illegal formation cannot be reviewed by the replay official. I to say, we've taken it to a new dimension now. Quickly, the Bengals try to get the Browns on the field with 12 men, and they did. And Woods makes the catch, and Matthews is there to stop them finally. But Back the Browns to 12. The Browns had 12 men on the field. And there's a flag down at the four. 
That's the attack offense when they tried to change defensively. Boomer stepped up to the line of scrimmage and they ran off the play. 12 men on the field, on the defense. And so instead of it being fourth down, it remains third down. It's all legal, but Bud Carson... On the field, half the distance, third down. You know that Bud Carson does not like it. Third and goal at the three. 7.20 to go. First half, wild half, 14-3 Cincinnati. Play clock down to 10 as they finally come up to the line. And Esiason calls a timeout. He calls a timeout. <laughs> what a sequence. Well, twice now the attack offense has worked exactly like Sam White wants it to work. And he has a, an individual, Boomer Esiason, who runs it really well. He calls great plays from the line of scrimmage. He reads defense as well. And they are very disciplined. Sometimes they look like they're in some kind of strange fire drill, but they know exactly what they're doing. The Browns tried to bring out a defensive change. They picked it up. They got it to the line of scrimmage, snapped off the play, and the Browns got caught. You know, here's another thing that Sam Weiss does to drive other coaches crazy. He brings his whole offensive team over to the sideline, and then he has more than 11 people in the huddle. So the opposing coaches don't really know what personnel is going to be out on the field on the next play. It's a good point, right there. You've yeah. got 13 or 14 guys there. And then they all kind of filter back out there. That drives other coaches crazy because they don't know what personnel is going to be out on the field for this third down play. Sam White will take every possible. In fact, even there is a late. Yep. He sends 12 men into the huddle, mm -hmm. and then Eddie Brown trots off yep. the field. Sam White works with the rules more than any coach in the league. What he did is he sent 10, yeah. then he sent two more, then he sent Brown out. Third and goal. Holman in motion. And Icky Woods to the two-yard line. Where this drive began, Mike Johnson makes the tackle. And so the Bengals, who started at the two, got to the one on a first down play, are back whence they began. Messiah's in with a few more choice words for the crew. Bob McElwee, the referee. And Breach comes in to attempt a chip shot field goal. Boy, Michael Dean Perry last time. You talk about a guy getting off the football. He almost looked like he was moving ahead of the football. Tremendous anticipation. He's the guy that really forced the screw up in the backfield. 20-yard field goal attempt, and I suppose this is a moral victory of sorts for the Browns because the Bengals had a first and goal at the two and have to settle for a brief field goal. And, folks, we've got more Monday night looniness. Oh, here we... A fracas? I think somebody was trying to explain to Boomer Siason on the sideline what actually happened. He, he is still exercised, screaming and ranting and raving, and it... I don't think it... it Helped his judgment on that last series. Well, I think the coaching staff of the Bengals right now, they have always appreciated Boomer Esiason's competitiveness. But right now it's time for Boomer to go down, uh, have a seat on the end of the bench, take a couple very deep breaths and try to gather himself to get back out there. There's a lot of football left to be played and having a quarterback that is uh, bordering on a... Uh, on, a, on, a, on a breakout, on a, some sort of a, a confrontation with the officials is not really conducive to winning games. A great competitor, though, is Boomer Esiason. 6-18 remaining in the first half. Let's listen. This is called high-risk television. Mm. Well, good audio. I think they're explaining in extreme situations. I think they're talking about going up to the booth for a little corroboration. Mm -hmm. It is, I said earlier, taking the whole uh, replay to a new dimension. I, I don't think I've 
maybe they've done it in the past, but not that we knew about. Why don't they just call up here and get our opinion? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That'll really screw them up. <laughs> Lee Johnson checked down by Eric Metcalf in the end zone. Cleveland will take over at the 20. And we can tell you that tomorrow night, it says here, Roseanne and Dan buy a new bed and start to have fond memories of the old one. It's a night of king-sized laughs on Roseanne, followed by Coach. Tomorrow on ABC. That's not Dan Deardorff, as far as I know. Before we get to tomorrow, let's wish Mrs. Mrs. Deardorff, Evelyn Deardorff, a happy birthday. Yeah. She's watching down in Canton, Ohio. Happy birthday, Mom. From your son, Dan, who can't say that. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Always wanted to say that. <laughs> First down from the 20 is Kevin Mack. Gets out to the uh, 23, and he is pushed back by several Bengals, led by Leon White. Well, the time has come for the Cleveland Browns offensively to keep the ball for a while. Keep their defense, this group, right where they are for a while. It hurt to put a few points up there. 17-3 no. to 3 at halftime is, if they could go in with 17-10, they'd be a lot more comfortable. Well, even if they don't score, Frank, even if they just get three or four first downs, three plays and out here would be a total disaster. And Kozar has to get a hot hand. He is 5 for 13. He keeps it on the ground. And Leroy Horde is wrapped up. James Francis made the initial contact. David Grant finishes him off. It'll be third and five up at the 25. One of the things the Bengals are doing is really stacking the line of scrimmage. The Browns are going to have to counter with some passing. The Bengals putting eight men on the line of scrimmage, daring the Browns to throw the ball. They're going to be forced to do it. I think the fans saw that. Second down, seven. You get an eight-man line, literally. Yeah. And a perfect opportunity to change off to the pass, and they didn't do it. Less than five minutes to go in the half. Cincinnati up 17-3. to three. Third and five, Cleveland from the 25. Kozar, low throw, and he has now misfired on his last six passes. Intended for Brennan, and Bernie is 5 for 14. Good coverage again by Rod Jones. He was right with Brennan, who can really work on man-for-man -man coverage. And Jones was right there. And Bernie tried to slip it in there, but he had to throw it low and away, and Brennan couldn't come up with it. Well, and now, of course, it's showtime. It's punting time. The Browns punting team has done for the punt what Dave Kingman did for the fly ball. <laughs> But he gets it away again. Price from the 34. Gets a block. Flag comes in at the end of the play as he returns it back to the 47-yard line. Against Cincinnati. Kenny Wolf is uh, passing Illegal information to in me. Back, number 52, during the run, 10 yards, first down. And just to follow up on that whole situation down at the goal line with the illegal formation, they did call up. They asked the replay official, Tom Kelleher, what he thought. And Kelleher said, I can't substantiate it because it's not reviewable. So they had to take it back down to the field, according to Kelleher, and make their own decision. But they got it right the second time. Yep. Not somebody who failed to report, but an illegal formation. From the 37-yard line. Let me say this is the last word, though. You can almost understand the officials calling up there because sure. it was an apparent touchdown. Mm -hmm. It was a supposed scoring play. Play clock down to its last kick. And a sack as Esiason goes down. But it's a loose ball. Brown. They are signaling Brown's football. Michael Dean comes out of there. Boom! <laughs> Get a new ball. Al Baker was the guy who created it. Bubba came in, jarred it loose. There was no whistle. And Perry taking a page out of his brother's book, The Fridge, when he used to score touchdowns out of the backfield for the Bears. All set up by good coverage downfield. Even though Baker, he had to make the big horn come all the way around to cause the fumble. And that was because of the good coverage. Credit that secondary with... Part of the turnover. He learned that spike from William, didn't he? He sure did. 
This is the exact break Cleveland needed at this moment with 4.21 to go. They're down by 14 at the 32-yard line. Little flip out to Mack. And Mack turns it into a nice game as he is out of bounds at the 21-yard line. Good play selection that time by Cleveland. Getting away from the stereotypical slam-bam with that big back attack on first and second down. Go to the air on first down. Look how effective it was. If Cincinnati is going to stack the line against you, you have got to be more creative on first down. If you look at David Fulcher, the strong safety. He's the third guy up there. He's right on the line of scrimmage. This time, Bernie is changing off when he sees that sack. Play clock is 2-1 as he gets it off. And that's, that's a lateral. live ball. No, they blow the whistle Ooh. on a very close play. Ooh. And the Bengals will argue that it was a backward pass. Well, I think it was a pass. I do, too. It sure looked like it when it happened. Simply ruled an incomplete pass. Look, we're at a little bit of an angle. The official is right there. Let's take a look again. Goes our back. Trying to get it out to Horde. Now, there he is at the, what? 30, 20, 20, 27, 27 and a half. Line. 27 and a half. Oh, well, it's at the 27 and a half. Uh, time is called here. They're going to review this. This is reviewable. The umpire, Ed Kukart. Wilcott came up with the ball. Now, he could not advance the lateral, but he, if it is a lateral, he did recover it. Tom Kelleher is the replay official. Okay, let's watch Bernie's feet. Bernie right now, this is the 27 right here, following back, following back. There goes the ball. He's straddling the 27 and the 28. Okay, let's see where the ball comes down. You'd have to say it was the 27 and a half yard line. <laughs> wow, from this angle right here, it sure looks to me like the ball came down around the 28. But yeah, from that angle, are we going to see enough to overturn the ruling on the field? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. That's to be conclusive. That's yeah. the key word. I don't think so. You would literally need to have a camera right on the 27 or 28 yard line shooting straight across the field to have a perfect look at it. And I think you'd almost need a perfect look when it's that close to overturn it. France is in there forcing Kozar to loft it up. Not so hard. Meanwhile, there's another thing at oh, play he here. Oh, he knocks it forward. The yeah. other thing at, at play, in play, is that the whistle had blown, indicating an incomplete pass. So the Browns could contend, hey, we didn't try to recover it because the whistle had blown. I think you're exactly right with that, Al. You know, meanwhile, that ball would have landed farther back because Leroy Hort actually got a hand on it and knocked it back forward. Yep. I mean, so what do you, if, you, if you rule upstairs, it was a backward pass, but the Browns come back and say, well, wait a second, if you blow the whistle, we're not going to try to recover it. Yeah, I don't know how, I really don't know how this is reviewable. Yeah. Well, here comes your we answer. We have a reversal. The ball belongs to the Browns on the 28 and a half yard line. It was a backward pass. If I'm not mistaken, uh, didn't Wilcox come up with the ball? A reversal of what? And then the ball had the whistle had to have been blown yeah. to kill the lateral. They're gonna say the whistle blew, but the Browns still had possession of the ball back at the yes. 28 and a half yard line. So technically what they're doing, they're giving them possession, but they're penalizing them the yardage. <laughs> Make sense out of that. That's yeah, that's the bottom line. It's a seven yard loss with a second down and seventeen at the twenty nine yard line. And Kozar going for it all and too deep intended for Brian Brennan. Phillips covering on the play. And if also, you're so back there, Fulcher, and they had Brennan straddled, he would have had to throw it perfectly, Kozar would have, to get it in there. Good coverage by Cincinnati. And that's going to make it 
fourth down. Well, the, the down marker says fourth, and the scoreboard says third. I believe it is third. <laughs> now we got the down marker. Yeah, they're going to... Well, they, they better get this confusion cleared up right now because the uh, scoreboard has third and 17. The down marker says fourth and 17. So they call up again to find out what's going on. I think it's third. I remember only two plays here. Remember they used to just play? One of these teams from Colorado? <laughs> Should be third. There have been only two plays, the backward pass and the incomplete pass. And the, the down marker says fourth, but that should change. Well, we had, uh, where do we have it, in Denver this year, the Denver-Kansas City game? Of course, the most celebrated case was Colorado and Missouri. Right, five down for the Buffaloes. Are they going to say fourth? Well, Carson wants to know what, but Carson has come out onto the field and he wants a, a recount here. Oh, either going to send his kicking team in if it's fourth or not. As far as I can recall here, it was first down on the backward pass. And it was second down on the last play. And I can't recall another play prior to that. Somebody's supposed to keep track of this, aren't they? Yeah. Count. <laughs> I mean, this is like high school. Well, this game was moving along rather rapidly until... The essential information is Cincinnati leads 17 to 3. 335 remaining in the uh, first half. Kevin Mack, remember Kevin Mack ran for a first down on the 21. And the first play yep. was the backward pass. Was the pass. backward pass. Right. It was the Mack run for a first down, then the backward pass, then the incomplete pass intended for Brennan. It should be, we feel, third down. I mean, we can only find the two plays after the long Mac run that gave the first down. The backward pass. They have just, I think they have sent down from upstairs the play-by-play yeah. play sheet. They photograph each play, Alan, and that's what they sent down. They photograph each snap of the ball. I think that's what Bud Carson is pointing out. Off the play-by-play play sheet, he's saying, hey, look at this. The Mac, it, it was the play with Mac. It was that little uh, swing pass. That gained 11. That was a first down. Well, there is no down right now. Kevin, the Kevin Mac play was clearly a first down. <laughs> Very simple. You just go back. You rewind the VCR. I mean, it's easier to find this out at home than it is here. Mm -hmm. Just check it out. Yeah. Put it on fast forward. It won't take very long. It should be. It's, uh, and it, we, nothing uh, that we can think of this future. All right, here's, here's the Mac play. From the 32-yard line, there's a little swing. First it, was, it was first down. That gained 11. He goes out of bounds at the 21, okay? It is a first down. And the very next play was a first down pass mm -hmm. to Leroy Horde that went mm -hmm. behind him. Here you go. This is now, this is the next play after right. Mac. That's and, first down. Right. And then Brennan in the end zone. And then Brennan in the end zone was second down. It's third down. Yeah. So here we go again. Third down. Third, third down. After all that. Okay. <laughs> Exhausted. <laughs> At least they got it right. At least it's, they got it right. Third down and 17 from the 29-yard line. They have to roll that. It's not supposed to be this complicated. Kozar with a lot of time.
to the five yard line. It'll be first and goal. Hey, that's class stuff by Mac. He knew he was going to get hammered. Never took his eye off that ball. Kozar laid it in there beautifully too, right? Over a defender in front of two more. Well, one thing has to happen when you throw it to a back that comes all the way down the field out of the backfield. You have got to have time to throw the football. And that time, the pass rush of the Bengals totally negated by the Browns. First and goal from the five. 2.56 to go in the half. Ford on a sweep. And it's White who was able to fend off a Mac block, and then Wilcox comes up to finish him off. It'll be second and goal. We talked about the Bengals, 28th and last in the NFL coming into this weekend defensively, 27th against the pass. As we saw it earlier in Seattle. You've got to put some kind of pressure on a good pass. And Kozar is a great passer, and you do not get to him, force him. He's going to throw a pass like he threw a moment ago to Kevin Mack. Just drops it in perfectly. Second and goal. Brennan lines up in the slot right. Slaughter to the same side. Now Brennan to the left. Metcalf split left and a fumble by Kozar. And he has to recover himself at the six-yard line. And that's going to take us very close to the two-minute warning. That's plain and simple. Bernie forgot the snap count. Bernie thought it was on two when it was on three, and he started to back out. The whole team stayed where they were. <laughs> he does not do it too gracefully. You know, quarterbacks can forget the snap count just like anybody else, and that's what happened. Every time you see the quarterback come up and lean over to the center, and is you know they're not talking about their family coming for dinner or something. And he's asking the center, "What did I call? Is it on two or three? Watch this. There he comes out of there. Yeah. Back is the sole back in this set. Brennan in motion. Kozar gets sacked at the 13, and it's a loose ball, but the play was over before the recovery. James Francis with his seventh sack of the season, the rookie from Baylor. And that sack takes away any possible thoughts of Bud Carson to going on fourth down for the touchdown. They'll send the field goal team out onto the field. Big play by this rookie, and he is... Just about everything they thought he would be coming out of Baylor. You talk to Sam White about him. He says we can move him around anywhere. He can do everything we want. And if he just gets a little more aggressive, he looked a little aggressive on that play. One fifty-six on the clock. Line of scrimmage is the thirteen-yard line. Somebody called the yeah, time. Somebody out. called the time out here. Timeout was called by Cincinnati. They Fourth took down. I mean, if they run the ball, maybe got it down to the two-yard line or something like that, it's, it's something you'd have mm -hmm. to think about. But well, certainly not after this. No, all options are gone after that sack. Correct. From 31, he's made it from 21 and missed it from 41. Pagel puts it down. And the Browns wind up with three. Well, that's kissing the sister-in-law, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You go into the locker room with that. You've been so promising. You get the big turnover. You get it down there inside the five and can't get it in. And now you're going to have to go in the locker room and look around in everyone's face. And they were down 17-6. The well, spotlight NFL running backs, the familiar and not so familiar. And you all know about uh, Eric Dickerson coming back yesterday and Bo Jackson coming back yesterday and Nicky Woods coming back tonight. And we'll talk a little bit about the uh, the new playoff structure in the NFL as well on our Toyota Halftime Report. Goodyear blimp, high above Cleveland Stadium, home of the Dog Pound, Section K-9. Coming down before the game and talk to some of those guys. You know, they're pretty normal. Yeah, they're, they're having a <laughs> good time. <laughs> I wish you could have seen the look. I didn't see you that going Alan with me. That <laughs> Alan, I just gave Frank when he said it looked normal. What did you do? Exchange arms? <laughs> <laughs> Bouncing kick down to the nine-yard line. Sanford Jennings. Back to the 31-yard line. The Bengals have one timeout at their disposal as this drive begins at the 31-yard line. 
we will go to Three Rivers Stadium a week from tonight. And Jim Everett will be leading the Los Angeles Rams in there. Rams trying to uh, rebound, and they did so yesterday with a 44-point outburst against Atlanta. Steelers got beat by the 49ers. I've never been to Three Rivers Stadium. It's amazing. I, I, I couldn't <laughs> believe that when you said that. Yeah. You'll like it. Great all stadium the, to watch a football game in. 13 years as a player and all these years never have been to Three Rivers. And growing up in Cannes, which yeah. is not that far from Pittsburgh. No, no. But the Rams haven't played there very often either. First down from the 31-yard line is James Brooks. Stumbles and can't get started and uh, gets dropped back at the 29-yard line. Yeah, Michael Dean Curry is wrecking havoc with that offensive line. He is so quick off the line of scrimmage. By the way, Dan, I spoke to you before the game. He said, tell Dan, get off me just a little bit. He said it with a smile, though. Oh. Remember, it goes back to Denver when he lined up twice offside. Yeah, he was only offsides by about two feet. <laughs> <laughs> Minor indiscretion. <laughs> you said it earlier tonight. He's so quick sometimes. Oh. Ahead of everyone else, he looks like he's offside. I don't know there's a lineman in the league gets off quicker than Perry. Watch him. I mean, just watch how his helmet moves before everybody else. Second and 12. Messiahson takes the Brooks and throws. And the pass is incomplete, intended for Mike Barber. Covering on the play, Tony Blaylock. Clock down to 104. Now Cleveland uh, has to be thinking about if this should be a running play by Cincinnati and they don't get the first down, that we'll take the timeout. And we'll try to get some points before the end of the half. Yep, that's what, exactly what they're saying. <laughs> That's what Bud Carson just told his team. Third and 12 at the 29. Browns almost jump. Messiah and throws, and that's Ooh. incomplete and very close to a flag, but we never very saw close. one. Intended for Lynn James and Stephen Bragg avoids. The laundry, just barely. Mm. Look, he did get a hand in there at that. He wraps him up with the left arm, but he escapes with what we'll call mm -hmm. good, close, tight cover. Uh -huh. Right on the side of the defensive <laughs> back, always have been. I call that great cover. That is excellent cover. Here's Lee Johnson, takes the low snap, his last punt was a 70-yard boomer. This is a liner to Stefan Adams who runs it back from the 28 to the 38-yard line. Ran into his own man and with 50 seconds remaining and two timeouts at their disposal, the Browns have it at the 38-yard line. They say that one timeout by the fact that Cincinnati went to the air on third and long yardage, so they have the two timeouts to work with. And Cincinnati might have been advised of a 17-6 lead to run the ball as Dan suggested earlier and force Cleveland to use a timeout. Now they have two. Four wide receivers. Mac the soul back. And they give it to Mac up the middle and there's some room to roam there for him. And he gets out to the 49-yard line. But the clock continues to run. James Francis makes the tackle. Those are running all across the field trying to find the referee to call a timeout. Yeah, that just cost the Browns about eight or nine seconds. Mm -hmm. as Bernie Kozar is having to chase Bob McElwee. McElwee chases the play as the referee. And Kozar, thinking that he was still in his vicinity, turns mm -hmm. to call a timeout and finds out that McElwee's about five yards downfield as he should be following yeah. the play yep. and I know that McElwee is faster than Kozar <laughs> Randall Cunningham could have saved three or four seconds by getting the McElwee a little yeah, well, yes he's not mad at me no no he wasn't mad he just uh, thought he'd file a little suggestion first down Cleveland at the 49 yard line Kozar slings it to the 41. A catch is made by Brennan. Great play by Brennan. He's out of bounds at the 29-yard line. He might have as good a hand as any receiver in this game today. And he 
somehow shakes himself loose. He doesn't have the blazing speed of a lot of outside receivers, but he got there when you have a great passer and give him time like Bernie Kozor had then. He didn't have that much time, but he was able to get it there. Watch this. Pulls it right up off the turf. That's beautiful. That is. I mean, that was not an easy catch. That ball was dying, coming in low. That was a brilliant, brilliant hands there by Brian Brennan. Brian Brennan, Doug Flutie's favorite target when he was at Boston Common. And Brian's younger brother is safety on the current Eagles squad. Those are throws. This is Metcalf, and he almost escaped. He takes it to the 20. He's tackled by Michael Price from behind. The Browns are down to their final timeout, and they're trying to save it. Pressure seconds tick away, and Kozar downs the ball to stop the clock with 10. Got a problem now, though. He's going to probably have to throw the ball into the end zone, or... Well, he's still got one timeout. Well, if he gets somebody completion and a little dancing around, he, he it will be close. Well, Metcalf came real close to breaking it. Yeah, it was an ankle tackle. And now this is where you want Eric Metcalf. Crossing a... Coming over the middle, and take a look at that. If it's not the ankle tackle by Price, Eric Metcalf just might have scored. Mitchell Price right in there. Not a lot, but got him down. Ten ticks on the clock. It's third and one from the 21. Kozar oh. throwing, and the catch is made. Unbelievable at the one-yard line. They have to call a timeout, and they do. And what a decision now for Bud Carson. Well, wait a minute. Is this... Are we seeing a show put on here by Brian Brennan or what? I mean, this catch was better than the last yep. one. I mean, this catch, the ball's out in front of him, and, I mean, we're going to see a guy horizontal to the ground making a catch out in front of him. Didn't surprise us because in Denver, he was the hero of that game, pulling it out late. Look uh, at that. I'll tell you how tough that is to flick it back into your body, <laughs> get your arm under it, and you run a grave risk of popping out a shoulder doing so. And watch him after the catch. He gets up. Not only does he make this catch, but he uh, knows uh, he hasn't been touched. He's going to get up and try and get in the end zone. Fabulous. Meanwhile, if you're Bud Carson now, you've got to go for the touchdown. You're inside the one. Now you certainly have to consider it. You've got Kevin Mack. You've got your big Mac back offense ready to go. I think uh, you Kozar have to. comes back in. They are going to go. You have to go for it. You've got Brennan putting him, put him in a position where he took he he in effect took the field goal away from them by getting too close. Well, I know this. I've got my big backs in there, but if I got to get this yard, the guy who's going to carry the ball for me is number 34. Oh, no question. It's got to be Kevin Mack. Three tight ends, or do you let Kozar try to sneak it in? No, 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 no. Well, no. I don't know. Not in the modern day of football. <laughs> Hoyd with Mack leading. And he's in for the touchdown. Mack did his job, too. Yeah. That's the change in our direction of this game. And that's the most determined run Leroy Hoyd has made in a long time because he gets hit right at the one-yard line. He gets stuffed right in the hole by Kevin Walker, and he takes Kevin Walker right into the end zone, a la what we saw Bo Jackson do to the Boz a couple years ago. Watch this. Watch number 59, Walker. Wham! Right on the one-yard line, and Leroy Horde takes him into the end zone. Big block by Mack oh. ahead of it. Corrick for the extra point. Different ball game. That's a pretty good for a sample. Oh, for once of a first down, Cincinnati wasn't able to convert, punted the ball away, and with less than a minute, Brian Brennan and the Browns come up with the best drive of their season so far. With Horrid. the exception of the one that won the game in Denver. <laughs> Horrid stunned Kevin Walker, and that is highlight film stuff. Brennan and Horrid. Back we come with halftime activities after this message from the NFL and a word from our ABC station. I said to Art Modell before the, the game, I said, I hope you never build another stadium. I know there's a, a lot of movement and sentiment here in Cleveland to build a, a new stadium, but boy, what a grand old place this ballpark is. And, who would have thought that the Cleveland offense would be well ahead of the vaunted Cincinnati attack, but only a 
32 total yards and a pair of turnovers for the Bengals in the first half. They're losing it all the way down the line, except on the scoreboard where they're leading. Johnson bounces one to Metcalf to start the second half. Flag thrown all the way across the field, and Metcalf is out of bounds at the 30-yard line. Bob McElwee, who was a busy man in the first half, begins the second half in similar fashion. That'll back Cleveland up. Holding number 80 on the run back, 10 yards, first down. Vernon Joins is the man. Dan, you're talking about a new stadium. The Browns figure to stay here, but uh, they did pass uh, a, a new sin tax in effect that will uh, supposedly finance a new baseball stadium eventually here. Well, and that's understandable because this, when you come here for an Indians game and you see 15 or 20,000 people in a stand, mm -hmm. it looks like no one's here at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, this park is actually way too big for baseball. Here's Max swinging to the outside, and Mac is taken down by White. Uh, just about the line of scrimmage, it'll be second down and ten. Did you pay Vincent come in kind of campaigning for that and winning the smaller baseball style stadium? Well, he pretty much uh, said, in effect, that if they didn't pass that tax and build a new stadium, that Cleveland stood a real good chance of losing the Indians. This town has had such a resurgence. You walk around now, new buildings going up, shopping malls downtown. I'm really happy to see it. I've been coming here a lot of years, and, and the people of Cleveland, they've been degraded by a lot of comments. This town is, is really, really back. Second down and 10 from the 18-yard line as Slaughter makes the catch. And he's taken out of bounds up at the 26-yard line. And it'll be third down and two. What do you call that, a fisheye shot? No, that's not quite a fisheye. What is that? Craig Janoff uh, has a impressionistic painting. Six millimeter shot. It's a guppy, I know. Quite a shot, right? Well, things have been relatively uh, quiet down in the dog pound tonight. This has. Uh, well, I paid a little visit before the game. The new kind of crowd in the dog pound. Uh, much more <laughs> subdued. Much more. They're also under scrutiny of a <laughs> camera. Yeah, the fish eyes on them. <laughs> Third and two. And up at the 30-yard line, that man Brennan again makes the catch. Rod Jones was there, but Brennan knows exactly how much he needs for a first down. And the drive remains alive at the 31. First and 10. Hot Brennan again. He gets man-for-man -man coverage by Jones. Jones covers him well, and he drives steps back into the ball. And Jones, the only way he could have prevented that would have been to interfere and get the flag. Yeah, some passes just can't be prevented. And that short little button hook like Brennan just ran is one of those that if the route is run correctly, the ball's thrown right. Not much you can do. First and 10 from the 31. Ozar deep over the middle and has it picked off at the 50-yard line by Carl Zander. And Cincinnati is in business at the Cleveland 38-yard line. Another bad throw by Bernie. That one he tried to sneak in. And no way that Zay could not see Xander. He just was, has enough confidence that he tried to force it. He didn't well, want criticism. He did seldom get the interception. We talked about that. But he really believed so strongly in his arm, he tried to put one in there where he couldn't get it. Well, one of the things that happened there is that both Bengal linebackers to that side were up on the line faking blitz. And then they dropped back. And it's hard to believe that Xander right there and 51, Leon White, were both on the line of scrimmage faking blitz and dropped back that far. And it pays off with excellent field position for Esiason and Cincinnati at the 38. There's the play clock. And Craig Taylor picks up a couple down to the 36-yard line. Tom Gibson in on the tackle, number 71. And for the Bengals tonight, we've seen a little bit of Taylor, and we've seen uh, some of Green, and very little of Vicky Woods. He's carried once. Brooks has carried once, and that was for a touchdown. Right now they go with Taylor as the eighth back. And now they have uh, Green in the backfield as well with him. Second and eight. Siathan. 
And he picks up the first down and about five more. A uh, big pickup, Esiason. Man for man coverage, the defenders in the secondary running with the receivers. Deep downfield, Esiason sees it, pulls the ball down. He was beyond the line of scrimmage before the secondary even came back and realized that he was making the move. Well, David Grayson was the guy that was really caught short on that one. He came on the blitz and was untouched, and he's got the responsibility of contained to that side, and he let Boomer get away. That's what drives defensive coaches right up the wall. Messiahson's longest run of the year, 13 yards. First down, Cincy at the 23-yard line. Brooks. And the man they call J.B. is out of bounds after a gain of two at the 21-yard line. Good, right, string out. Tackle. Good string out by Clay Matthews that time, stretching it all the way to the sideline. He didn't make the stop, but he made the play. Sure did, Frank. Fought off uh, Joe Walter the tackle, and that's why that guy makes a an annual trek to the Pro Bowl. Second and eight at the 21. That James Brooks and it's stacked to the left behind Mike Barber, and now he comes in motion. Whoa! And they give it to Taylor up the middle, and it's a first and goal. And the ball is picked up by Gash. Is the play down and dead? Well, there's uh, no signal from the official either way yet. We're going to have a conference. We have had no signal period until now. <laughs> Cleveland. We've had some bizarre happenings here in Cleveland tonight. All right, this, this is... Very strange. Well, I think we're going to take a look at this. Let's see what Craig and Kenny have for us. Let's quick, check it out from the other side of the field. You see the quick trap blocking that sprung Taylor into the clear. Now let's keep an eye on him right at the end of the play. There is the hit. The ball is still intact. Still intact. No, that's no. not a fumble. That's not a fumble. Not at all. No, he has control of the ball until he hits the ground. No. No, Thane Gash comes up with that, I'm afraid, well after the play. Mm -hmm. I think we will see the yep. Cincinnati offense back out on the field. You'll see uh, a happy Sam White in yeah. a moment. The lost in all of that was the block by Ken Moyer, the trap block, a good one to bring Taylor into that secondary. Nobody even touched him. You know, that's a... That's a situation where an official finds himself in where, he, he, you know, maybe he's screened for just a second, and the first thing he sees is the ball out on the ground. I mean, he almost has to rule it a fumble. But I think you can see right there that Taylor mm -hmm. has possession of the ball until he hits the ground, and that's where you invoke the old, mm -hmm. the ground can't cause a fumble, cliche. And uh, when we have the reversal, which we expect it'll be first and goal. I think it's beyond a doubt that it will be reversed. Sam Weiss seems to think so. He's already, he's calling plays. Yeah. <laughs> to, to get my defense off the field. You've got two play. offensive units on the field right now. Yeah, well, the ones in we brown better come off. We have a reversal. The ball goes back to Cincinnati. The man was down. The man was down. Now they'll have to uh, find the spot where he was down which was inside the 10, and it will be first and goal with 11.15 to go in the third quarter. Bengals ahead by four. This is the type situation that would bring some dog biscuits out of the pound. Mm -hmm. That's something that the Browns organization has really cracked down on, the, the objects being thrown out onto the field. <laughs> a bone <laughs> like that could hurt a guy. <laughs> First and goal from the eighth. Up the middle. Craig Taylor to the five-yard line. Mike Johnson, the middle linebacker, makes the tackle. Second and goal. We still have over 10 minutes left in the third quarter, and we have already seen kind of a 
kind of a potpourri of mm -hmm. odd events here this season. Brown left, Barber right. We haven't seen much of Tim McGee. He's been hurt. Here's James Brooks taking it to the four-yard line. <laughs> Look. James Brooks, so strong. Thane Gash makes the tackle. Still squirming for yardage was Brooks. I just, I just love to watch James Brooks play. I know that he plays bigger than he really is, but still for a guy with a bad neck, uh, an odd place for him to run the ball inside the tackle, Frank, down on the goal line. Now they'll try and use him down there, and it's what they can't do with Eric Metcalf. And that's a strange phenomenon because they're about the same size. And meanwhile, Gilmer Siason will probably give himself an option to roll out of there looking for a receiver. Third and goal now as Esiason lofts one out of bounds. Brown, the intended receiver, and he wasn't close to being open. Blanketed by Claiborne, and so the Bengals bog down. And in comes Breach to attempt the field goal. That's Boomer just exclusively working one side of the field, and he just threw the ball away. Excellent coverage that time by Raven Claiborne. Boy, he just smothered Eddie Brown. Dave Johnson to put it down. This is a wonderful fake position for mm -hmm. Sam White. You've done it before. Yep, Johnson flipping to Holman against New England, but it's a 21-yard chip shot for Breach, which he connects on, and that puts Cincinnati up by seven. With 9.32 left in the third in Cleveland. <laughs> the Cincinnati Bengals go 34 yards after the interception and uh, get a break on the and a correct break on the reversal from replay cash in for three and now Lee Johnson puts it in the air against the wind so it hangs and it's taken by Stefan Adams and from the 19 the man who normally returns punt brings this kickoff back to the 33 yard line and Bernie Kozar comes in well, Again, a pretty critical game for the Cleveland Browns uh, as they try to pull to within a game. Otherwise, they would be three back in the Central. And if uh, the Browns beat the Bengals, in effect, Houston would be in first place because the Oilers would be four and three, the Bengals would be four and three, and your first tie break is head to head, and the Oilers have beaten the Bengals, and they're only meeting this season. It'll be two and zero oh the division. That's not bad. Kevin Mack to the 36-yard line. Have a moment to welcome a new affiliate, WLAJ, Channel 53, Lansing, Michigan. We welcome them to our ABC family of affiliates. Happy to have you on board, guys. State Capital. Second down and seven. Browns at the 36. Metcalf, the motion man, and down he goes at the 37-yard line. And five, like putting up a little red flag, here I come. Yeah, really, I mean, uh, so stereotyped in, in running Eric Metcalf wide and, and, and the screens wide. He wants to be a running back. Eric Metcalf says, I want to run the ball, I want to run it between the tackles, I want to run it more often. And uh, there may not be a, a more frustrated man on this football team than Eric Metcalf, who just can't seem to settle into one position. And here's where the Browns have been playing him most, split out as a wide receiver. He's the second guy up from the bottom. Yeah, he's handled it too awfully well, Dan. From the gun on third and six, it is deflected and incomplete. It was intended for Webster Slaughter, but uh, Kozar, who's prone to having him knocked down with a sidearm delivery, as that, that one batted down, we believe, by Tua Tagaloa, number 96. If man, imagine if Bernie was a shorter Wagner, quarterback. Whoa. The Browns, the well, it wouldn't be a trip to Cleveland without a look at <laughs> Richie Westline, our cameraman down in the dog pound. A good look there at Natu Tua Tagaloa. Teams are, the pass. teams are coached defensively to throw their arms up in the air when they're pressing in Barn Bernie. Here they come with Wagner punting. And a fair catch is called for at the 26-yard line by Price, who says he was touched. And the official said, no, sir. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll be down in a minute, Richie. <laughs> 20 to 13 Bengals. And Esiason on first and 10 gives it to Taylor. He comes to the outside and is tackled at the 31 by Mike Johnson. Well, I tell you, they are, uh, you're right, Frank, doing a tremendous amount of construction in downtown Cleveland, several office towers going up, and several luxury hotels as well being built here in Cleveland. Really has been a remarkable change over the past few years. I'll be reviewing some of those uh, hotels in my forthcoming book, tentatively titled, Would Lowell Thomas Have Slept Here? I believe you went to sleep in the construction crane at one of the sites. <laughs> Can I write the forward? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Second and six as Esiason lofts it, and it went right through the hands of Eddie Brown. Oh, Eddie. Oh, Eddie. Eddie. Eddie heard Felix yeah, Wright. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and if Eddie. he's in the area, you better listen. Because Felix mean, Wright will give you a pop. One of the league's great receivers developed a pair of Tyrannosaurus Rex arms there. Watch these babies shrink before your very eyes. <laughs> Watch his arms grow shorter and shorter as he senses Felix Wright. <laughs> <laughs> the disappearing arms of Eddie Brown. <laughs> Soon to be a miniseries playing near you. <laughs> and well advised. At least he's got his arms. Felix Wright was really zeroed in. Third and seven. Boomer, nobody home. Intended for Holman, and Esiason gets a knockdown. Rob Burnett came blitzing into the 90. And they give Cleveland a chance to get the ball in good field position. And it has been a sputtering Cincinnati offense. Burnett gets in there, the rookie from Syracuse. Gets to tell everybody, I got the boomer. Boomer has been a buster tonight. Yeah, Three yeah. for 12, 53 yards. With an, with an INT as well. Mm -hmm. Lee Johnson, the punt. Right. And it's a bad kick. Do you good field position? Down at the uh, 44. So Browns get it near midfield. 6.55 to go in the third. And since he's by seven. The blimp. Peeking in Cleveland uh, Stadium. Used to be known as Cleveland Municipal Stadium, and they changed it privately owned now. As the Browns take over at their own 43-yard uh, line, since they on top 20 to 13. Cincinnati showing blitz. They come with it. And Kozar forced to throw hastily and incomplete, intended for the uh, future Hall of Famer Ozzie Newsom, and it has caught more passes than any tight end in the history of the National Football League and who announced his retirement last year and then reconsidered wide open but Leon White was in the face of Bernie Kozar one of the most popular players ever to wear a Cleveland Brown uniform is Ozzie Newsom. and they really don't have anyone standing in the wings to take his place, and if that ball is just a yard or two, then he gets his form shorter. Order, he'll, yeah, he'll replace Charlie Taylor, fourth all-timer. Play clock down to two. Second and ten. Fake screen to Mac, and then he does hit Mac, who springs loose, and Kevin Mac takes it to the 35, and he flag is down. In uh, fact, face a pair of them, and that's. You know, that is another great catch because that ball was low and behind Kevin Mack. And Frank, you know more than any of us how difficult that is to catch when you're running away from it. It's also very hit. Five yards, face mask foul from the 33. Of course, from the end of the run, first down. That goes against Fulcher, but a very heads up play on the part of Mack. He came out on the flat, and that's where he would have got the ball. And he reads Kozar and then. Instead of staying in the flat, like a lot of backs would do, he broke downfield and he was wide open. Now here you'll see the face max on the part of 33 Fulcher. We get five more out of it. Yeah, but the real damage that was done was done at the end of this play where 
Kevin Mack gets hit right in the helmet. He has to come out. And Derek Gaynor sells him number 27. And that's uh, Metcalf who looks to throw a pass and then keeps the football and is run out of bounds at the 24-yard line. Good presence on the part of Eric Metcalf who threw a touchdown pass a year ago, but when his receiver was covered downfield and the cornerback did not come up, pulled the ball down and picked it up yardage. Made six out of it. You guys want to see something sharp? You want to see a heads-up play? Watch David Fulcher right here. Watch how quickly he turned and signals to his own man he's going to throw the ball. Watch Fulcher. Yells. He yells at him right there. Stay with him. Stay with him. He sensed that Metcalf was going to throw the ball. Great cornerback said, I got him. I got him. Great play by Fulcher there. Turns out to be a six-yard gain on the ground. And here's Leroy Horde taking it down to the 18-yard line behind a Kevin Mack block. And Horde is slow in arising. Kyle later, perhaps he had a concussion. And you'll see why here. Solomon Wilcox, watch how he hits Horde right where his neck meets his shoulder pads. Right there. Boy, you could see Solomon Wilcox, the safety, come flying in there, and that's a that's the kind of a blow that that can really send a guy out. Hord finally got up and appears to be okay, at least for the short term. First down. Mac breaks the tackle, but still doesn't get anywhere. He uh, ran about 20 yards laterally, but for no gain. Stopped by Rod Jones. A good tackle by Jones. He goes about 182, 185 pounds, and he has been run over a couple of times by this man, Kevin Mack, and yet he took Kevin Mack for the only way he could. But that's Fulcher meeting Kevin Mack at the line of scrimmage. The Bengals are really making things miserable for the Browns and running the football by putting eight people up near the line. Ford is back in the game. Second and nine with slaughter in motion. Slaughter makes the catch, and you heard it. Tackle is made by Lewis Billups, number 24. Four nineteen, and the clock ticking down in the third quarter. Well, I don't think you have to think at this point. Brennan, once again, he's the guy that can work himself open is the Browns have found himself, themselves once again in the pass position. They like to use him in motion, and Bernie can watch as they motion who's going to be picking him up man for man. Third and six. Good protection. Those are fires, and it is incomplete, and we don't see yellow. Well, that's just good defense on the part of Price. He was right there as the ball came into the hands of Metcalf. He was all over him. But I think what we might see is that what was perfect about the defense is how he pulled Eric Metcalf's hands away and kept him from catching the ball. Look at this. No contact before the ball's there. Gets the arm in there. Jostles the ball loose. Couple of big plays tonight by the rookie from Tulane, Mitchell Price. 31-yard field goal attempt for Corrick, who's been good from 21 and 30 and missed from 41. And it's Pagel who throws it, and it's incomplete, intended for Van Waiters on a play that has worked in prior years, and comes up a bust here. Hey, the Bengals were not fooled at all. They were all over this. Well, I'm not sure that was... I guess he intentionally made it look like he bobbled the snap. But watch how this ball is actually bobbled by Pagel. He puts it down and, and, and looked like a fumble. This wasn't a design play. No, that was a fumble. No, he, just bobbled it. he bobbled the ball. That's that, was an ugly. that was an alert play by mm -hmm. Van Waiters going out late mm -hmm. to try to get mm -hmm. into it. Yep. Watch Pagel try to set this ball down, and he doesn't get it down mm -hmm. cleanly. Yeah, exactly. And now he's going to get up, try to make something out of it, and really credit Van Waiters for realizing that there was a miscue back there and try to get into the play. And Carrick for not kicking his hand. They got the, they made a, something out of a, absolutely nothing, and of course mm -hmm. they didn't get the completion, but heads up play. Well, I think what you're going to have is an ineligible receiver downfield. I don't know if they threw the flag or not, but you had a whole bunch of the Browns that ended up downfield. 
downfield. That penalty will be declined. First down. We were talking about, you know, remember Waiters and Waiters caught a big touchdown pass on a design fake field or fake, yeah, fake there, field a couple of years there ago. There is Waiters right there. Watch the bobble here. Then Waiters alertly goes out. Now he is lined up in an eligible position, but he is wearing an ineligible number. To be an eligible receiver, he must report. You also have number 74, Paul Farron, about seven yards downfield when that ball was thrown. And he got the wrong yeah. number. It was incomplete anyway. So since he's ball with Harold Green taking it from the 14 out to the 21 yard line for a gain of seven. Dave Grayson makes the stop. Boomer Esiason meanwhile with a very cold hand. He's 0 for his last six and 3 for 12 for the evening. And he has not completed a pass since uh, early in the second quarter. Well, Al, it's like what you talked about earlier. I mean, here is a team that relies so much on play-action passing, and yet their running game is producing less than 100 yards a game. I mean, offensively, if they can't run the football, they falter. Tonight's one of the few times this season that they've run the ball somewhat effectively. Second and three, play clock down to one. They just do get it off. And Craig Taylor has the first down with some nifty running and taken down from behind out at the 44-yard line by Bob Bukowski. But Taylor well, some nifty moves. Is it a surprise that if they're going <laughs> to run and get some yardage that it happens to the left side? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a left-handed team, and why not behind the great one, Anthony Munoz? And so many times you'll see a Bengal back like that break into the secondary without ever being touched. There's a look at Munoz, not only the best offensive tackle in football, but the undisputed king, the leader of this football team. He's what we call the bell cow. Where he goes, the rest of this team follows. From the 44-yard line, Taylor again. Well, they've been going to Taylor tonight, and they started the game with Taylor and Green, and he has seen some action. And just to update now, remember, Icky Woods hasn't played in a year. Icky Woods tonight has carried the ball very sparingly. There he is. He's carried it three times for three yards. James Brooks, who's had that uh, neck problem, has been used sparingly, but with some effectiveness as he has scored a touchdown. It's wise, though, to treat... Woods that way. Full reconstruction of the knee. You let him get his confidence back. Don't push it in there too quickly, and I think they're wise to treat him this way. Second and nine. Green comes in motion, takes it on an end around, or a slot around, as it were, and Baker and Michael Dean Perry aren't fooled. Well, does Michael Dean Perry mess up a lot of things in the middle of that line? Well, he only knocked off both both Reimers and Munoz. Yeah, well, they're going <laughs> to, you know, Dan, he is the pass rush for Cleveland. Consequently, he always gets the double coverage. You got to account for Michael Dean Perry, and that's why he's so beat up, so banged up, because one guy will usually block him, another one's hitting him. A lot of pressure, though. A great burden on his shoulders. He is the defensive line for the Cleveland Browns. Final minute, third quarter. He's also offside, isn't he? Well, the <laughs> closer you're going to get. Third and ten, and there's your ten and five more for Harold Green, the South Carolina rookie. He's tackled by Perry, and it's a first down at the 40 on what should be the final play of the third quarter. Now, he's speeding up a little bit. They think they're going to keep it in the same decade. Great hustle that time by Perry. It's not often you'll see a defensive tackle mm -hmm. catch a guy downfield. Especially after he lined up offside, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Give me a breath. <laughs> Give me a little breather. I'm, I'm going to give me everything I've got. To the fourth we go after this word for ABC Station. Fifteen minutes to go. Bengals have the lead, and uh, what a week for the Rhineland. Cincinnati <laughs> and the good burgers of that town. As the Reds came home uh, after the sweep of Oakland, they celebrate today and uh, may celebrate another win tonight. You talked about who would have thunk it, uh, a sweep of the A's. and I want to say congratulations to Lou Pinello. What a, uh, what a fabulous job of managing he did with, uh, with the Reds. Well, the town of Cincinnati, hopeful that... Uh, 
Today's celebration is a rehearsal yeah. for another celebration around the 28th and 29th of January, a couple of days after the Super Bowl, as Brooks starts the fourth quarter by taking it to the 33. And it was a drizzly, rainy day in Cincinnati today, but that didn't dampen the spirits. Chris Sabo getting a, a hero's welcome after a sensational World Series. And there was Jose Rio, the uh, man who won the first game and the fourth game. Mark Schott, the owner of the team. The Where's Schott's Yeah, season. Lou Pinella. And, and uh, thousands gathering downtown to celebrate their baseball world title. Now their football team trying to go 5-2. and two. And Boomer Esiason hands it to Brooks. And Brooks inside the 20, inside the 10. And JB takes it to the 7-yard line. Stopped by Claiborne. I said that's his trademark, though. When he knows somebody is going to make the tackle, he will always get the two, three, four extra yards. And over a career, a 10-year career now for this man, that that really piles up the yardage. I mean, there's a guy who's hurt. Here's a guy with a bad neck, has a chance to duck out of bounds. And who would have blamed him? But no, he sees somebody coming, and Frankie goes right yeah. after him. Back against the grain, that's his trademark. Now, he knows he's that... Claiborne's got the shot at him, and he just lowers his shoulder. He gets a couple more yards out of it. Bruce Reimers made that thing happen. First and goal, Craig Taylor, knife to the four. Craig Taylor, the ball carrier, the tackle by Tom Gibson. Tom Gibson, 71, makes the stop. Bengals lead by seven, as we have just begun the fourth quarter. Bengals next week uh, go to Atlanta and then home for six of the final eight as you take a look at the total yardage. A huge night rushing the ball for Cincinnati. They're doubling their season average, averaging only 97 yards a game coming into tonight. Two weeks ago against the Rams, they threw for almost 500. Fake on second and goal, and Esiason hits Brooks, and Mike Johnson, along with Minifield, Able to prevent him from getting into the end zone. Al Baker, meanwhile, leveled Esiason, who threw that one going backward. Now, Boomer is looking into the end zone, looking for Eddie Brown. Showed a lot of presence to check off and find Brooks. And he has to wait for just a moment. There's Brooks. He's faking into the line of scrimmage. He's not the intended receiver. He's looking for Eddie Brown. He's covered now. He's spots. 21 breaking into the open he had to hold it just long enough for Al Baker to parry him third and goal I don't and uh, what happened here I don't know they Play got it off dead. they got it off before the play clock this must be some sort of a false start or something Boomer uh -huh. saying they didn't get a call before the snap. Mm -hmm. And the reason Cleveland was calling timeout was either did they have enough men on the field or they certainly were the wrong defense. The Boomer wanted to exploit it, and he felt they did not call timeout quickly enough. Let's take a look. What was the 51? He went out of there. Yeah, you can see Eddie Johnson calling the timeout, and clearly he's calling it before the snap. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that Boomer has much of an argument. In fact, there's... Mike Johnson, the linebacker on the other side, calling it as well. Okay. Call a timeout just because you don't have the right people in there. It's become such an age of specialization that sometimes I think it's a little too technical. Only thing we were missing there is a lead to a Johnson & Johnson commercial. <laughs> Mike and Eddie. Third Mike and, and Eddie. goal <laughs> from the two. This is the tenth play of the drive coming up, and a science has thrown just one pass. It started back at the 14. Fake to green, and Esiason fires into the end zone. Touchdown, Mike Barber. Well, you touched on it, Al. They were able to run the ball at will, getting down inside the five-yard line. Now they come back with play action. Cleveland's got to think run, and the receiver is wide open. Barber wide open, just standing there, as the Browns had to respect run. Well, Barber comes in motion, and the Browns were thoroughly confused. They got four guys standing at the linebacker position. One of them has to come across the formation with Barber, and 
it was obvious that they they just didn't know which one of them was responsible for the Cincinnati receiver who was in motion. So Barber getting some extra playing time tonight. First year man out of Marshall University and uh, getting more playing time because McGee has been injured and on the bench. Breach boots it through. On the drive, Boomer two for two for four yards, but everything else was on the ground. There's Barber. Look at these four guys right here. One of them has got to make a move and go with Barber when he comes across the formation. They're all waving. And look, look at, at the that. play action. Look at that. They freeze for just yep. a moment. Power is hovering, uh, or not hovering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be a major scoop. The Goodyear Blimp Enterprise, as I find my copy here tonight, piloted by Patrick Henry, who said, "Give me liberty." No, he didn't. <laughs> Spectacular <laughs> night, though, wasn't it? Was supposed to rain all night long. Something happened to that front. Mm -hmm. Hung around up in Chicago right here. Yeah. Turns out to be a very, very pleasant night. Temperature about uh, 50. Well, things are going to chill considerably here at Cleveland Stadium if the Browns don't score some points. First and ten from the 20-yard line. Newsom in motion. And Kozar hits Brian Brennan. Well, what the Cleveland is hoping for is the same type of uh, miracle they pulled off in Denver on a Monday night game two weeks ago when they were down by nine and looked as if they had no chance. And Vernon joins with a couple of key catches and they... Shocked the Broncos. Eleven twenty remaining. Second and two. Those are fires. That's caught by Slaughter, and he has a first down up at the thirty-seven yard line. Rod Jones is at a very busy night. Makes the tackle uh, out of SMU. Webster Slaughter, the type of player for Cleveland that has to step forward right now. I mean, in a situation like this, and this is critical, down by a pair of touchdowns, I mean, you have to count on your older guys. you got to count on the guys that have been in this situation before. They know not to panic. They know there's lots of time left, and those are the guys that kind of have to tow it up, get to the line, and make the big play. From the 37-yard line. And a sack back at the 32-yard line. And as Kozar gets uh, sacked by Leon White and not to Tua Tagaloa. Well, you look at the Browns' offensive set. They had four receivers deep downfield. Bernie Kozar had enough time to deliver a pass to a checkoff man. And there was nobody there. And all four of them were at least 15 yards downfield. Very poorly designed play. Art Modell, and uh, on the right is Ernie Acorsi, who is the uh, GM of the team. And uh, that is not a uh, happy picture. A man who desperately wants his team in the Super Bowl. Second and 14. Well, it's well known the, uh, as the play clock gets down to one. And on second and long, it's Mack up to the 35. The Browns are clearly the best team to have never played in the Super Bowl. And they've been so close. I mean, three times in the last four years, they go to the AFC Championship game, only to be denied by the Broncos on each occasion. And there will be uh, a lot of talk about Bud Carson and his immediate future. Tomorrow, if the Browns lose this one. A lot of extenuating circumstances for their key defensive players hold out right till the start of the season. An entirely different offensive line operating here tonight than played for them last year. But two and five, that'll be hard to stomach. Third and 12, and Kozar nearly gets sacked and then does. At the 23 yard line, Jason Buck and Natsuchu Tagaloa are there. And uh, give Francis an assist on that. The rookie linebacker was the guy who had Kozar scrambling. Price drops back to receive the kick. Brian Wagner to punt. Again, Brian has had four blocks in three weeks. None tonight. End over end kick. 
It's more like a field goal. Yeah, that's what blocking a punt will do to a punter. Uh, Wagner last week had a 27-yarder. He's had one good punt tonight and a couple of duds. And once again, Cincinnati following that punt will have good field position. It isn't just blocking him. You shake up the punter. And uh, the problem he had in Seattle, barring Denise Tom of USA Today from the locker room. What the Bengals have done is they have set up a curtain now, and you saw that blue curtain. And the players um, can get undressed behind that. And uh, Sam White has said the media has been quite cooperative since he instituted that policy in Anaheim. And uh, continued last week in Houston and will tonight in Cleveland and continue to do it for the balance of the year. Meanwhile, you also know that he was fined nearly $30,000 by Paul Tagliabue for the Seattle incident. And White was telling us last night he has received about $6,000 in contributions from 4,000 sources to help pay it. People who agree with his philosophy. As Taylor yeah. takes it to the 50. If the commissioner was hoping that Sam White was just going to accept the fine and, and be quiet about it, I, that's really not the case here at all. Uh, Sam is very quick to point out that of the 4,000 and some letters that he has received, the... Uh, two were kind of neutral and only one uh, was a negative letter that he's been getting support from all 50 states even a letter from australia and also getting support from within the nfl he said he has gotten contributions from owners coaches players and two anonymous people at the nfl office he didn't just say that he opens up photo stats of the mm -hmm. checks that he's received they better remain anonymous <laughs> <laughs> right now <laughs> Eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter as the handoff goes to Green and he works his way to the 47. Anyway, uh, we felt compelled to bring you up to date on that story, which of course has been one that has been and it seems be to be beaten to death mm -hmm. and pureed. It seems to have been accepted to the the way the Cincinnati Bengals are doing it. No complaints. Everyone with equal access to the players. And it seems to have made. Sam happy. Uh, his bank account somewhat depleted. Well, would have been a lot simpler if he would have just let her in. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but he, he has been pilloried by the print press as uh, Esiason hits Icky Woods and uh, the extra takes it down to the 36-yard line for a first down. I know a lot of you are saying, now what is Icky Woods doing in a ball game where the Bengals are leading by two touchdowns? That's not the situation. If Mickey Woods needs the work. He needs to get a couple plays under his belt, and this is nothing more than training camp work for Icky Woods. Get in there in a selected situation, get him the ball, let him take a hit. Now, now Icky Woods is able to look at this coming week's practice a lot differently than he would have if he wouldn't have gotten any contact during the course of tonight's game. There it is. A science and fewer completions in a, in a full game eight tonight. He's only completed six. But his team is up by two touchdowns, and Green takes it down to the 31-yard line. Stopped by Chris Pike, and time is running out on the Cleveland Browns. 6-21 remaining. And you don't have to throw the ball when you can run it like the Cincinnati Bengals are moving the ball on the ground tonight. Well, this when you get around to throwing it, as I said earlier, when you can move the ball on the ground like this with a play-action Taking quarterback by Boomer Esiason, you can at any, almost any time go up on top and get the six. Defense, always thinking run. There it is. Five. He's trying for Eddie Brown. And it's too deep, and Brown was covered uh, quite capably by Felix Wright and Frank Minifield. It will be third down and five here's a reminder coming up college football on abc regional action this saturday those of you uh, in the east and the midwest uh, will be taking a look at michigan against indiana and out west it'll be uh, the trojans trying to rebound uh, they uh, fell victim to an old fumble ruski by arizona they'll take on arizona state will be in pittsburgh on monday night as the rams meet the pittsburgh steelers Third and five from the 31-yard line. And making his way down to the 
26 is Craig Taylor, and that is close to a first down, and I believe he has it. You watch Craig Taylor, they have to be awfully pleased with the sixth-round draft pick from last year, who spent much of the year on the developmental squad. He, he looks like he belongs out there, and particularly with Brooks Ailey, even though he had a great night tonight, and the fact that Dickie Woods is just easing back into it. They've got themselves a football player in the Six foot, 228 pound Taylor, out of West Virginia. New Jersey boy, eh? play a lot of tough football in New Jersey. Cincinnati now 224 yards rushing. From the 26, they'll keep chewing up that clock. Taylor for one, and we're down under five minutes. Well, what about the Browns? And what about if they lose this one, which they appear on their way to uh, doing? They'll be two and five. And what about Bud Carson, a man who was hired after uh, spending several seasons as a very respected assistant coach with several teams. Took him to the AFC Championship game last year. One step from the Super Bowl. And now a whole other story. So many successful years as a defensive coordinator with the Steelers. Highly respected with the Jets. But nothing but problems since he has arrived in Cleveland. Second and nine. Craig Taylor up the middle. Of course, uh, they've yep. asked Art Modell and Ernie Acorsi about his future. And uh, Art said the other day, uh, I'm not going to give him a vote of confidence. A vote of confidence is a kiss of death. I mean, for this man, a difficult situation. I mean, you know, a change in midseason uh, rarely ever results in improved play by the football team. On the other side, Bud Carson's record after this game, if the Browns go ahead and lose it, will be 12-12-1 and as head coach of the Browns. And as I said at the top of the telecast, maybe even more importantly, 0-3 against the Bengals. Mm -hmm. That's like Alabama losing to Auburn or Michigan losing to Ohio State or USC and Southern Cal. I mean, some rivalries, you just got to hold your own. You can't get shut out. And Bud Carson's been shut out by Sam White. And not, not only is it a rivalry amongst cities. Defense, five yards, third down. And uh, two cities in the same state. Paul Brown owns the Cincinnati Bengals. And he, of course, was fired by Art Modell here in Cleveland. So I... So it really hurts. The Whatever also, decision it is on the part of Art Modell, it won't be an easy one. No. He's a compassionate man. He's uh, also a very passionate man about football he wants to win he wants so desperately to go to the Super Bowl they have come so close no matter which way he goes it's going to be very hurtful and you look at the coaches under Bud Carson if they do make a change who do they go to third down and two Esiason trying to keep it alive and take some more time off the clock and he does Brown inside the 10 and Brown down to the one yard line not only gets down to the one, winds up staying in bounds, and the clock keeps moving. Mike Johnson and Felix Wright make the tackle. Oh, but Frank Menefield, oh, it's easy to miss an open field tackle, but <laughs> when you're really in the open, it just sticks out. Let's watch Eddie Brown, one of the best in the business. And that's Frank Menefield, number 31. He's one of the best in the business. Three times a pro bowler. Just a good move by Eddie Brown, and Menefield is embarrassed. Things aren't going to get better for Cleveland either. Where do they go next Sunday? Candlestick Park. First and goal. Dickie Woods, is he in for the touchdown? Yes. yes, he is. Now do we see the shuffle? Look out. This is the big question, folks. <laughs> if he can get loose. <laughs> the delayed shuffle. He's trying to get onto the dance floor. <laughs> what? All right, folks, what's happening here? Well, he has to do it behind the bench yeah. because <laughs> if he did it in the end zone, it would go, uh-uh, uh-uh. Oh, oh, oh. That's trouble. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's maybe, back. Maybe they'll give him one <laughs> that he can do in the field. That's a minor shuffle. <laughs> Icky, bitty, bitty one. Very, very minor. Not, not a Roseland variety. Well, Icky gets the last word here at this extended weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> Rage boots it through. 
And uh, that is all she wrote. 34 to 13. Dan, Dan yes, could sing. You'd be singing Turn Out the Lights about this point, wouldn't you, Dan? Nick, you'd be shuffling along. Ta ta. Here for Dan Deardorff as this one winds down. 232 to go in the fourth. Cleveland has not scored a point in the second half. Bengals now lead by 21, and Lee Johnson has been booming them into the end zone. But he has the wind at his back. Does it again. Metcalf downs it. Out it comes to the 20, and uh, assuming Cincinnati uh, does not uh, squander this huge advantage, it'll look like this in the central. Cincy by a game over Houston. Steelers two back, and the Browns two and five. Two twenty-six remaining. Bengals to Atlanta next Sunday, and the Browns to San Francisco to face the undefeated 49ers. And uh, of all things, well, play clock down to two as Cozard gets blitzed and somehow avoids the initial surge, but not the second. Solomon Wilcott came flying in and nearly got him, and then Jason Buck and not to Tua Tagaloa who teamed up for an earlier sack, do so again. That was an automatic on the part of Kozar. He obviously saw that the blitz was coming. He changed it off and was still unable to get the ball to a receiver. Perfect picture. That was a big story, doesn't it? Second and 21. Mack to the 16. Two minute warning comes at 159 left in Cleveland. Bengals in command. Consoling. There's no way. Vertigo. <laughs> For you late night viewers, <laughs> you haven't been to the refrigerator too many times. <laughs> For those of you that just got home from your favorite late night spot, we probably didn't do you any favors with that one. <laughs> Third and 13, and Mike Pagel has come into the game. Or apparently was going to come into the game. It is Kozar who stays in, and the catch is not made by Vernon Joins on third and long. Ricky Dixon breaks it up. It'll be fourth down. Well, uh, at least one thing has happened good for Cleveland tonight, and that is they've not had a punch block. After having four blocked in three games? Not well, yet. Not yet, yes. But they do indeed punt it here. Each team has scored off its opening drive. It was 17-13 Bengals at the half, and the second half has belonged to Cincinnati. Well, what's really discouraging for Cleveland, uh, once one of the great defensive teams against the run, is that they've allowed 230 yards rushing, and Cleveland just might get that ball back. As it was well, dropped by Price. Even no. that doesn't go their way. But to give up nearly 230 yards on the ground and it is absolutely no consolation to say that we have held Cincinnati under a 100 yards passing. When you give up 230 yards on the ground, that's big trouble. Brian Wagner with another weak punt. Look at uh, the gang that has brought it to you. Headed up by the Wolfman and Craig Jenner. And Monday Night Football makes its uh, only stop of the season here in Cleveland, Ohio. And our thanks to the guys up here, Malibu, Kelly Hayes, and, and George Hill, and Rooney. As Eric Wilhelm hands the ball off to Icky Woods for a gain of a couple. Dan, do you have a very important announcement to, for us here? As soon as Ronit gives it to me, I will. Okay. Oh, yeah. Fumble, 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 fumble. Okay. 
This telecast is presented by authority of the National Football League and is intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the express written consent of the Cleveland Browns and the National Football League is strictly prohibited. You are so nasty. Second and seven. Harold Green to the 34-yard line. Oh, let's not have a fight now. Let's nope. not have a fight now. Well, Cleveland Stadium has just about emptied out. Boomer didn't have the best night of his career, but he's going to come away with a W. Well, it looks like they're looking at Boomer's right hand, which, of course, is his non-throwing hand. Boomer doesn't appear to be in a great deal of pain, though. A little different last week when he was 12 of, what, 21 for 130 yards. Maybe those aren't doctors. Maybe those are his financial advisors discussing how yep. to... <laughs> any new commercials the Boomer Man might be able to do. Might have been filming one right there. This is the final play of the game. Kneeled down by Wilhelm. Sam White will go home with a victory. Bengals win it here in Cleveland. You think Jerry Glanville is looking on? Yep, he's... Uh, I think Sam Weiss just told Frank Minifield, you're a great player. I, I think that was the gist of that conversation. Well, Weiss is a, a happy man tonight, of course. And, well, even though he's smiling, this bud's forlorn. <laughs> oh, well, oh, 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 it's, <laughs> I know you just thought of that. No, well, 34 and 13. Night, guys. Yep. I can't afford that rider. See you in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah.